Hello, hello, hello. This is Dr. Andrea Little Mason, officially known as Dr. Dula. And today, huh, sometimes I get to talk to people that are very, very special to me and for reasons that people don't yet know, but will know. And this sister here, Yael, is one of those sisters. Oh my goodness. I had known her online for a couple of years, few years, who knows. And then I got to meet her at a conference. And she's one of those people that just, yeah, you know, I'm going to let you meet her yourself, but she'll put a fire up under you. She is one of those, like, look, she says it, you know, and she says whatever she says, and that's exactly what she meant to say. And I just need you to meet her for yourself because she is one of these people that has been advocating for us really reclaiming all of those practices of our ancestral mothers, of those women that went before us and really reclaiming them as our own and holding on to them. But I'm going to let you figure that out because I know she's gonna got a lot to tell you. But first, Miss Gael, would you please tell these people who you are, my sister? I'm so excited. <laughs> you see me um, you're trying to gather myself. I'm like, let me gather myself. I'm so excited this is happening. Okay, go. I know. Love. This is so much love. My name is Yael Bat Yisrael. I am the owner of Flatbush Doulas. I am the founder of House of Shifra and Pua. And I am a certified lactation counselor. And today will be the first day that I would say this, this title. Um, I'm a traditional healer. I'm a traditional herbal and nutritional healer. Yes. And this, <laughs> I told you. I'm going to be right. I'm going to be right. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm going to be right today. I promise. <laughs> And I started my journey to this very place. Um, if I'm being honest, I started this journey as a child. Wow. I started this journey as the daughter of a labor and delivery nurse who retired after almost 40 years of service in New York City in, in Spanish Harlem. There is a rose in Spanish Harlem who came home with all her different stories of the ups and the downs of birth, who talked about the experiences that she had as a nurse who really wanted to assist her patients in having the birth that they wanted. And some of the pitfalls that she experienced from some of the other medical professionals who had other points of view and other agendas in mind, who spoke about, uh, those those things of times past that most of us have never experienced experienced mm. those things such as scopamine and her firsthand experience of what that would do to the birth and mothers. Sis, explain she that. Also, Sis, explain okay, that. So, you don't know what that is. So scopamine is a drug that was given to women to. I don't know what it was given for, really, because it, it doesn't seem that it would assist them in birthing. But what it basically did was it knocked them out. It caused them to not know the difference between reality and, you know, hallucinations, whatever, hallucinations. nightmares, because I won't say they were dreams. Yes. And it paralyzed them and it totally disconnected them from the birthing process such that I'm sure it facilitated a lot of postpartum depression and a lack of bonding and a lack of desire to, to breastfeed. And in addition to that, the body would do so many different things that the women would have to be strapped down. Yes. Um, sometimes the husbands would be asked to leave because she'd be calling a man a whole other man's name. I mean, yes. So... And that's firsthand, you know, that's firsthand. My mother, um, all praise to the most high, she just turned 80 years old on um, January 1st. Um, so that's a blessing. Um, it's just yes, a total man. blessing because, you know, she's here, she has a history and she came from the island of Grenada and she left Grenada at 17 years old 
Um, I know this is supposed to be my story, but you know, I was. Um, I just think like, it's that's so inspiring. You know, that's, that's <laughs> part of it. Part of it is us telling the story of our mothers. You know, that's how right. we get to where we are. Keep going, mm -hmm. sis. So she left home at 17 and, you know, she went to seek her fortune and she went to Trinidad and she was the one who ended up when she came to America, she brought all six of her siblings and her mother up here. So at this point, you know, she really is right now the matriarch of my family. My grandmother, may she rest mm -hmm. uh, and live on in blessed memory. She passed away in 2015 and she was 92 years old. So, um, you know, my experience of birth is all shaped by that upbringing. It's all shaped by the women around me who never made birth seem like it was something that we are un incapable of doing. I've heard stories of my grandmother laboring with my aunt. Uh, may her memory be for a blessing, Auntie Pamela. Uh, laboring with her during Hurricane Janet, sitting um, on what they call a sofa, which is not a sofa, which is like a covered upholstered bench, not a sofa as what we know it yeah. to be. And just laboring while a hurricane is going on. Oh my God. Um, so, you know, I do this work in that type of a presence, that type of a stance that my grandmother bore seven children and she never had a doula. She never had a birth assistant. She was just, you know, having to bear it on her own. And, you know, my mother being her oldest child, she was able to see some of that before she went away. And her heart was for the medical field. Her heart was for nursing. And she gave her service, but she also had a certain level of strength mm -hmm. and a certain level of, um, you know, when you cannot be moved, when you won't be shaken. And so I think that is what, you know, ha I have brought into my work because a lot of the message that I say, um, you know, I have this thing, I'm about to put it on some t-shirts and it's like, you know, all medicine ain't sweet. You know what I'm saying? Like everything, everything that I tell y'all, <laughs> come on now, it may not be what you want to hear, but you know, any healer, any herbalist, any mother of the Caribbean, or for that matter, any indigenous people will tell you part of your healing is when you got to drink those bitters. Come on. And you got to drink that bitter root and that bitter bark, and you have to shore up your liver so that it can do the job that it is meant to do. And for many of us in this country, on these shores, we have been so far removed from any sense of self-sufficiency any right. sense of nationhood that we are dependent upon a system that is not have our best interests, you know, at heart at all. And so when I created Flatbush Doulas in 2015, um, my mindset at the time was that I'm going to open an, a doula agency and get other like-minded people who can provide that same service because I don't think that I am what you would call um, like the typical doula. I don't think that you're not. <laughs> if you were going to say, oh, you know what? Here's a good profession for you. It, doula would have never came in my mind. Like before I did this work, I was a New York City Board of Ed school teacher. I taught seventh and eighth grade language arts. Like I was that teacher. Uh, giving Steve Biko speeches to my students to read. Um, <laughs> looking back, I was like, sis, you was really on it, you know. You were doing, you were doing um, the thing. <laughs> you was doing a lot, okay. And, you know, I went from that into the after school world, which blew my mind because as an educator at heart, I saw how much we could really reach children when we stopped pressing them with like norms when you were just having a natural teaching and learning experience. So that's when I got into like sharing a lot of the things that I felt are like, you know, the, what they call the domestic sciences, you know, sewing and, yeah. you know, teaching them different folk songs that I had grown up with because I realized that regardless of whether or not they were 
were able to pass certain standardized tests and so on, their culture, once that was in awakened and enlivened within them, they were going to be able to get all those skills. And I feel the same way in terms of the birth world and the birth work. What is happening with Black women is that our culture is not it's like a non-factor. It's not even. Yeah. It's not even a matter of it not being embraced. It's like it just doesn't even exist. But because of the fact that my mother was a labor and delivery nurse, because of the fact of all the other nurses who were her colleagues and who I had heard stories about, because of those midwives who in Grenada were nurses, but that was just a part of their yeah. nursing training was that they had to learn to become midwives. So because of them, I'm here. And because of my, you know, my Auntie Vera, may she also be a blessed memory and her wisdom be something that we continue in the earth. She died at 93, but at 90, she had the presence of mind to tell my mother all the herbs that I was going to need postpartum. And that came from the fact that I pulled it towards me. Um, a lot of what we mm. don't realize about information and wisdom we like to blame the elders, the fact that they didn't teach us. Um, like my mother, she talked about how. Tell the people, <laughs> y'all. And wait, I'm telling you, I am looking around because I don't know, I'm not going to interrupt her. I cannot find one pen. I do not want you to think I am distracted. I am sitting here like I have so many things to say. And how am I at my desk and cannot find a single writing utensil? Because we're in the oral tradition, honey boo boo child. I'm trying to tell you, you, better, you better get this mouth to ear. <laughs> you better use that memory right now. Yeah, because go, sis, you go. Couldn't be you writing. Were... Listen, you couldn't be writing. Sometimes you had to just sit I, this, and listen. This has never happened. I said, I am at my desk and there is not a you, nothing on the floor. Now, I should have known something like that would happen with you. But continue. <laughs> You were telling us you were about to tell about one of your aunts, I think, or somebody. Yeah, so Auntie Vera from Trinidad, who was one of the people who my mother met when she first went there when she was 17. Um, she, my mother was going to her 90th birthday party, okay, and it was in February, and my daughter was due in March. And I was like, what part of the game is this where you go take a trip international? And I'm with child, you know, I was doing that. And she was like, girl, you pregnant now and you're going to be pregnant when I come back. Yes. You are not having, this your, this your first child, you know? And so I'm just trying to tell you the kind of mindset of, yeah. of, of this lady, you know? And I was like, well, if you're going to go over there and you're going to leave me here like this, then you, you're going to go get my stuff. Because I was told by a good friend of mine uh, Yehosheba, also Trinidadian, she was telling me like all the different things that people drank or what they needed to sit over and bathe in and all of that. And so that's another thing about wisdom. Going back to my original comment about people thinking that the elders didn't, you know, sit them down and tell them. Um, I have an elder in one of the houses of worship that I frequent, based Shalom here in Brooklyn, and her name is Ima Ruth. And she always say, like, you cannot come to her and be like, but y'all didn't teach us, blah, blah, blah. She'd be like, huh. Huh. when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Because yeah. you have to draw this information to you. We are such in a state of mm -hmm. being, uh, you know, subjects. Like, we have a real peasant type mentality that, you know, someone is supposed to just provide and you are supposed to just kind of work yeah. and hopefully it will trickle down your way. And my thing is that even our ancestors, in the midst of their enslavement, come on, they still had some secret societies. Yes, they did. They still yeah. kept some wisdom and were whispering it to each other and continuing on throughout the generations. So, what's our excuse? Because you have, you know, this great digital platform, you have everything at your fingertips, and you still like, oh, but so and so didn't tell me. And so what grew out of Flatbush doulas, I can only do so much as a doula with a client, you know, exactly. each client. Exactly. Um, I've always been a teacher. I've always been once, you know, social media, I'm like, oh, we making videos. Okay, boom. You know, I have a thought I'm making videos. I'm doing it. And then one night, um, really, I call it a divine download. 
I have this book here. I pulled it out. The pages are literally falling out of this book. And it's like, you know, work hard. Did you see that? Yep. I work see. hard, no drama, have fun, right? Yeah. So, you know, that's that's the slogan, y'all. Because, you know, we got to work hard, but we don't want no drama. And that's it's right. got to be fun at the end of it all. And I sat here and I just started writing down, like, all this information. And I was like, what is this? I don't know what this is. I came to my mother in the middle of the night wow. and I'm reading it to her. And I'm just like, that night I got that our mores and our uh, cultural norms are not just something that are like nice, you know, that's cute. Mm. Oh, you got the fan with the feathers like that's so cool it looks cute oh this is nice then but what i got was that our very ancestral science and our indigenous customs were literally encoded ah. with life-saving science life-saving rituals and information and i was like okay so how i'm gonna bring this to the people because i know what i know but I sound crazy. Okay. And, you know, those of you that know, you know that, you know, I am an Israelite, um, you know, AKA Hebrew, AKA Jewish, you know, whatever that title is, those people who have always followed these laws that were set aside on how to live well in the earth. Cause that's what the whole point of those laws were. Mm -hmm. And the thing that struck me as I was doing my studies and my reading and so on, was I was like, wait a minute, hold it. So you mean to tell me that the Israelite people would not exist if not for these two midwives, Shifra and Pua? Come on, sis. You mean to tell me that if they were to just go ahead and take this command that they received and just do some inf infanticide, and kill all of these firstborn, and not just firstborn, but all male children of the Hebrew nations, you mean to tell me we wouldn't exist? Because um, when you kill off a whole segment, you're saying that you're you're not going to be able to reproduce. There'll be no more boys to grow up to be men who will have fertile sperm that mm -hmm. will create babies. Come on, sis. And so I said, now, wait a minute. So what about these ladies? Because we know that this history, this uh, Hebraic tradition and custom does not always readily elucidate the contributions of women. We know this. We know that there's so much that's hidden. And then we know that what's out in front, it may just be like a sentence. And so it's like, okay, you got to, you know, go a little deeper. Yes. And like, what happened? You know, what happened next? Because we know that part, but we don't always know that it says, that the most high blessed them and that he set them up houses. And I was like, well, if you know, like I know the Hebrew word for house buy it. Yes. A house is a structure, but even when you see us talk about how certain lineage of King David, we talk about the house of David. Yes. If we have, these women being set up in houses, it occurred to me that, wait a minute, this is not just a physical structure. This is a lineage and this is a legacy. So if this is a legacy, yes, we can still be able to find some remnant and some evidence of it in this very earth today. So now, if that's the case, let me look at where I know, according to the, the history that was passed on to me, let me look at where I know those African people who, you know, are known as the Hebrews, okay? Where would they be now in the earth? I already know that, but let me look and see if I see some traditions. Let me look and see if I see some customs and some culture that would affirm what it is that I think is my hypothesis, because we're going to try to be scientific about it, even okay. though I know this is divine, because I can't expect that everybody's going to see what I see, exactly. right? Because as a visionary, sometimes we get very upset when other people don't see what we see, but the creator gave you the vision, and it's going to be for you to build it out, and then other people will catch on once there's something, because they can't see inside your mind. So 
I said, okay, let me look at the Levitical laws in reference to childbirth and postpartum. Because when you have a nation, you have to have a way that you do certain things. Yes. And I said, no, look at this. Right here in this very law, it's prescribed for a woman to be separated for a certain number of days according to, <laughs> according to the gender of the child that she has born. And she will then bring a sacrifice to the priest, which was, which was a sin offering. And you say, well, what was, you know, what was the sin that took place? Because this is kind of like, you know, this thing is getting kind of, you know, convoluted uh -huh. and so on. And it just, to me, was very coincidental that even years ago, I believe it was the New York Times when they did an article on uh, Ema McLeod was her name. When she talked about growing up in Montserrat and how she knew that her people were the Hebrews, she said, when women had babies, they were set aside for 40 days. She said, my uncles were circumcised, et cetera, et cetera. So my thing was, how can we look at this culture and see how these very things are still affirmed today? Yeah. And so I wanted to, not just for, you know, the world, like I'm putting my culture on the map. I wanted to do it even for the Hebrew women of today yeah. who may be very fruitful, who may be a part of really taking on this commandment to be fruitful and multiply. But sis, are you resting? Ah, you know, has your, your husband and I'm like, Ooh, I know I'm treading now. Cause I don't want to get in your relationship. And you're going to say, I L you know, it's not your business and be quiet and da da da. But has your husband realized that this time was prescribed? So therefore, if I relate that to the crisis in black maternal mortality today, related, related sis, then come I can on, say, well, it. you know, I've had people tell me they had to go back to work after two weeks. Exactly. Or what about the women who they're not working, but they work in the home and they have other children and their mate is not very compassionate or sympathetic, you know, to that giant dinner plate size wound on the inside of their uterus. Because just because you don't see my blood, you know, just running on the outside of my body, that doesn't mean that I don't have a wound. And so I know that we are modern women and people don't want to hear Yael talk this old timey talk about, you know, how you need to sit your butt down after you just had a baby because we've advanced, you know, and we are modern and all of that. But if it's killing us, sis, if it's killing us, would you pay attention? Like if the diet that we're eating now and the stress level, because, you know, there's things that are, that you can you, that are in your control. We know that the that the medical profession right now is at a crossroads. We know that, you know, time is up. Basically, yep. Yep. people are telling it like it is. We are seeing the obstetric violence. We are seeing the, the inherent and the blatant racism. And we know all of that. But do you even think that there's another way for you to birth? So that's kind of how I'm entering into this paradigm because I know there's a different way to birth because I had a home birth, right? Actually, right here in this room. Wow. Believe it or not. Um, <laughs> actually, as we speak, right? And, you know, my daughter's placenta was buried. Like, you know wow. what I'm saying? Like, all wow. of that. Um, but I say that to say that, you know, sometimes we get so much into turning our old ways, right? That the new ways that we have taken on, they're not helping us. And no. not only that, we're mm -hmm. afraid. Like we are literally afraid that somehow what we would do to heal would somehow be in conflict with what it is that the creator wanted for our lives. And so I had to kind of realize that birth was normalized for me. Postpartum healing was normalized for me. Mm -hmm. And I kind of had that as a privilege. Like people think sometimes privilege is just something that happens because you're rich or you have white skin. But no, it just means wow. that you have an advantage over other people. 
in a particular area. So for me, my advantage was like, I'm 45 years old. And in my mind, I literally know that if I wanted to have a baby, I could have a baby right now. And I know that I could have a healthy birth right now. And it almost sounds like you're just a lunatic, but I don't have that fear. Yes. That's called adrenaline to pump through my body instead of oxytocin. Yeah. Because the adrenaline will cause you to close up. You know, I don't have that lack of support because I literally, um, I don't allow it in my space. And the people that I have around me are solid enough that if I say to my mother, well, when you're on that vacation, make sure you bring back my herbs. At least she never even seen those herbs before. <laughs> Auntie Vail was like, you need this, 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 this. My mother was like, oh, they said, there you go, growing. Okay, whatever, you know. And so she came back. <laughs> and so I created this course, right? This birth and postpartum for us, by us. And mm -hmm. I meant it, okay? Because it was a lot of people who wanted to sign up. And I was like, this one's for us, you know? Like, I'm not saying y'all can't. Yeah. But, you know, I'm really saying you shan't, <laughs> right? But, um... <laughs> You know, when I created this course, it was because I have always been the kind of person that if during this conversation right now, Andrea was to say, um, you know what, sis, I think that you need to get up at 5 a.m. for the next three days and, you know, say your, your affirmations, say your prayers and just drink like 16 ounces of water. I think that that's the plan. I'll be like, OK, then. Let's go. Whereas I know some of y'all gonna be like, but what's the significance what's the of so five a.m.? What's the what ev is it evidence based in any way? So my thing was, I know that y'all are like that, and I know your clients are like that. So I'm not gonna set you up. I'm not gonna come with all my bushwoman talk and just be like, look, just you know, trust me, it's good. I said, you, which is how I grew up, right? Like, okay, yeah. drink this. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all just gonna drink this, you know. But what I did was, based on this divine download that I got with all this information, realizing that we had to honor these contributions, these inventions, these rituals, I said, let me go do some research because I know it's out there. Because other people research us all the time. All the time. Whether or not, whether or not we, you know, get anything from that research or whether we're even affirmed by it. So I began doing some research. And lo and behold, these hypotheses of Yael by Yisrael yes. were just being held true. Yes. And I come to find out that the Grenado midwifery model, with its low technology, low access to resources, was yielding yes. better birth rates and maternal mortality rates than this system here where we have all this technology. And so I started asking my mother because, you know, over the years, of course, I've gotten to know some of her, not just her colleagues here, but some of, she's in an organization called the Grenada, the Grenada Carrier Coup and Pitti Martinique Nurses Association. Um, their, their, their abbreviation, Grenada Carrier Coup, Pitti Martinique, is Grin Carpet. Let's not talk about that abbreviation, but yes, Grin Carpet. So... <laughs> Those are my ladies. So they're all people who were either nurses in Grenada, Karakou, and Pity Martinique, or they still are nurses here. And they all come together and they do things like they've donated um, a baby warmer to the hospital back in Grenada. Mm -hmm. They do different um, fundraising. They do various social events throughout the year. And one of the ladies in the group, uh, elder midwife Imelda Cox, She's a quilter. And so from years ago, yeah, from years ago, she and I had talked about sewing and she's also a poet. So um, most of my people who know me in the birth world don't know that I'm a published author. Nice. Um, <laughs> that I self-published a book of poetry way back in 1999. <laughs> um, and so... <laughs> And I would have talks throughout the years. And as I said, she's an elder, but she is like mad lively, like all about when the Calypso come on, she's going to be the first one, you know, doing her thing. And I was like, you know what? I want to interview you because we were talking and, you know, I found out, of course, she was a midwife back in Grenada. 
And come to find out, she never lost a mother. Wow. And I was like, so um, let me get this straight. You were doing home birth. Listen. With twins? Listen. You do, Wait, you was doing breech babies? Listen. You, oh, y'all was having, people was having cesarean sections? Like, all of this was going on, like, in the hospital, at home, in the clinic you was giving prenatal care. You're doing all of that and no, you know, no maternal mortality? And you talking about this was the 50s? Oh, I need you to sit down and talk exactly. to me. Exactly, exactly. And so we sat down and from that, um, you know, birthed the beginning of a series called Shifra and Pua stories. Yes. And we sat down over, you know, a period of hours and, and I edited it and so on. And honestly, everybody on Facebook who I asked, I was like, give me some questions to ask this midwife. You know, like all my doula friends, all my midwifery student friends, everybody was having all these questions. And when I tell you, I sat down with this lady, this elder, this beautiful, you know, matriarch. And she told me what it was that she did that was so unique to make sure that these women didn't die in child labor. All I heard was education and caring. Come on. That's all I heard. That's all I heard. I was looking for something deep. Mm. I was looking for, you know, like she had the potion, right? She was going to tell me the potion. You know, I was about to market that. Girl, we was going to do it. And she was like, no, I cared. Like I cared. And she basically was like how she was all about community. If she didn't know you and she wanted you to get prenatal care, she would ask so-and-so to talk to you and tell you to come down the road to the clinic. And so, I mean, of course, first person came to my mind was Jenny Joseph. Yes. Yeah. Because the JJ way, you know, when I went to, that was a highlight for me when she came to Brooklyn to the YWCA and did a training. And I was like, to my mother, you gonna come to this training with me because I want you to meet this lady. Like, I want you to hear this. And you know, oh like to have those two women come together. And that was a highlight for me because, you know, so many times we don't realize that the mindset and the stance and the energy is older than we are it is. it's bigger than we are and so that's why this interview means so much to my heart because you are someone who you put something in the ether you put something in the in the works in 2017 mm -hmm. that <laughs> looking at those seeds today Oh and I, you know, I said it then and I'll say it now, you know, those, those 10 women who were on that stage oh at that God. conference, oh my God. when you brought us up and basically gave us a charge, I'm like, if y'all don't know this lady that initiated us, that's on you. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, let me, but I know, and I know what I'm going to do. And, you know, for me to come back home and the very next month, my aunt, yeah. you know, tragically, suddenly passed away in my home. And I, you know, did my best to perform CPR, yeah. the whole stream of events and the dark place that I went into after that. And all of that, you were one of the people who I was like, I need to talk to this sister because I know she knows. And I'll never forget when you said to me, you know, I know this is really hard and I know you love your aunt and I just feel like this experience is going to transform you in such a way. It's going to transform your work. Hmm. And, um, you know, and so that's my prayer. My prayer is that my aunt's memory is, uh, is blessed and that is carried forward through my work even as a, as a lactation counselor, because the time that she spent here with me, when she was talking to me about her experience, you know, trying to breastfeed and what worked and what didn't work. And it was so great when I was able as a lactation counselor to say, you did a great job. You wanted the best for, 
your daughter, my cousin, Nakima, you know, you did a great thing and give yourself credit for what it is that you did. And I could see her whole expression just, just change. And my thing is like, we don't realize how much healing we have even in our words, you know, uh, the Hebrew scriptures say that the power of life and death is in the tongue. Mm-hmm. And a lot of what we're experiencing is, you know, I have to say white folks, I'm sorry, but <laughs> <laughs> I have to say white folks, like, you know, our European, uh, you know, our European friends who at the time were not friends, right? Because they, you know, they were a part of this awful life-changing torture that our ancestors went through that separated us from so much of our culture and so much of our normalcy and our personhood. Yeah. And that's why it's a crime against humanity. It's not just a crime against us. Yes. But one of the very, you know, um, deliberate acts was to tell us that this new religion that we were being, you know, shuttled into and, and, and broken in order to absorb it and to become a part of it. One of the things that we were told is that our traditions, our customs, that's right, our little fabric of our life and the things that kept us healthy and safe, that those things were all of the devil. Those things were all backwards. Those things were all, you know, archaic and evil and evil. Yes. And so that word Okay, that pronouncement, that spell, there, you know, I'm gonna go right out and say it's a spell that was cast on us. That still exists today. It still exists today. It still exists amongst us. I don't care what is our creed. I don't care, you know, what's our diet. Yeah. You know, certain things that we believe are, you know, that's evil. People don't trust their own intuition. People don't trust their own gut feelings. Yes. We have been so socialized to be victims that you will be in a situation, whether it be with a doctor, and you will be t- asking, you'll be second guessing yourself. Yes. The person will be, you know, totally disrespecting you, totally disregarding you, and you would not even say, you know what, I need to get up out of this situation yes. right now. And so that's why you see the current birth culture, you see there's a call for what's called advocacy. And I'm always very, you know, this is why I'm, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna offend the black doulas now. Yes. But I'm always, you know, I'm always very leery of that as a, 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 a way of being, because my thing is our advocacy has to happen prior to the birth room. You know, this is why I made this course a childbirth education course is what I called it. I could have called it a lot of things. Like one of my students is literally like, I don't know why you don't just start opening up a doula training academy because this right here, you done taught people how to be a doula from the prenatal to the pregnancy, you know, I mean, not prenatal, excuse me, preconception to pregnancy to birth to postpartum. And why are you just saying this childbirth education? Like, why don't you go ahead and start training people to be, you know, doulas. And I can't say that's, that's totally out of my, you know, like I'll never, but my thing is we already have people doing that. What I need y'all to do right now (laughs) is to learn, okay, about this body and how these environments affect us, these foods affect us, these models and then now begin to realize that you literally have freedom to make a choice. I think we really don't realize that we have freedom to make a choice. Like I'm gonna go out and be very, you know, vulnerable and transparent and say that I literally had a Medicaid health plan when I had my home birth and it paid the midwife. Mm -hmm. But literally my mind was, I will not have a baby in the hospital. And if I'm saying that, and my mother is a labor and delivery nurse, (laughs) like you got to know something ain't right here. You understand? Because I should be the one saying, I'm going to go to her hospital that she retired from. Yeah. People are still there, da, 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 da. But it's the model itself. It's the model. It's the labor 
suffering in the bed. I wanted you. I I wanted you to talk because there. I what I love that I have heard. First of all, I love it that. Let me see if I can collect it. I love. I want people, especially women of African descent, black women, however we call ourselves, to understand that we've been saying this for a while. There, there's not one, just one black woman that feels like this, you know? Right. There's not just one black woman. You said so many things you talked about, just like you just said right now, why are we, why, why are we sitting in a space and it doesn't feel right, but we're going to sit there anyway, but we won't get up. I just saw someone post something yesterday that talked about, it was a woman, she said, I'm pregnant. I don't want to take that whatever shot. And literally I had to turn the video off when the doctor said, you can either take this shot like an adult or, and, and I turned the video off. I said, I can't hear it. Yes, girl, I, I can't go back. I can't hear it. I can't, I can't because honey, in my mind, I, when you talk about the fact that we are so conditioned that 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 thing is evil we won't move we are it's like there's a big segment i won't say we like none of us are doing anything but there's so many that that fear of oh that's evil backwards bad wrong that we won't move and so i believe we need to be everywhere i believe we need to be fighting the fight everywhere but at the same time uh let me say it right I'm not. A, I'm, I'm for people birthing where they feel the safe, safest to birth. Okay. Amen. Okay. But at the same time, we will say we're afraid. And you just mentioned your home birth. We'll say we're afraid to go to the hospital, uh -huh. but still go when there are other options. Right. Because it's like I, I have to. You know why? Why, why aren't you looking at the other options that you have? I love, I mean, you deconstructed so many things. I mean, honey, you broke the things, said all the things. And, you, <laughs> and I love that because, I mean, everything from, girl, I'm, look, I'm going with the oral tradition today. Everything back to when you started talking about the midwives and you said it was a house. This is a legacy. No wonder we feel called in a certain way. No wonder we feel pulled in a certain way to do certain things. No wonder. And it's not just one or two black women. There are many right. of us that are looking for the, that are looking at and looking for the ways to reconnect because we are, I believe, I know everybody doesn't feel called, but I believe that there's actually a call that's happening that's saying, hey, you know. We look at all the other legacies that there are in the earth and in the world, and we say, oh, that's hmm. of the whatever lineage. There is a lineage here. I love, love, love all the emphasis that you placed. I mean, even your grandmother birthed and during a hurricane. It happened. Just and that aunt, that that aunt, that dear aunt, she was the baby. See. It's she like, was a baby. There's so there's so many ways for us to reconnect. There's so like you said, there are and it, it, it's true. There's so many ways that we can reconnect. And everyone in this, so here's my little thing. Everyone right off says, Well, you should you should just say that you're training doulas. <laughs> and so here's my thing, you know. And I I feel like People can call whatever, whatever they want, but I just believe that the call and the thing that we have to deal with as Black women is so much bigger and deeper and more than a profession that was established less than 30 years ago. Talk about it. We have a work that we have to do. And oh my goodness, I think I almost just laid out. when you The healing, <laughs> when you said you got this download, I, I received a similar kind of download based on just understand, well, not really a download in that sense, in the sense you discussed, but just to understand and say, wait a minute, even in the Southern states, even in the South, 
where I'm looking back at my family, I'm like, wait a minute. The women weren't dying. Do you know they weren't even dying in the 1920s and stuff when they were really, they were, they were dying more in the hospital with, at that time, the white coat, white doctors from the beginning, they were dying more. From the beginning, they had to find a way to coax us into this unnatural space. From and I guarantee you that they were dying of sepsis. Probably were. I guarantee you. Okay. I guarantee you if you go and you look. And that was one of the things when I asked, do you know that elder midwife Imelda Cox told me that she followed up with her patients for nine days? postpartum you know what it is for a midwife to be visiting you for nine days yeah. and checking in there's not going to be any postpartum depression that's undetected it's not going to be any hemorrhaging that you say oh maybe i think it's okay but this look like a little bit of blood you're going to be having some type of immediate intervention and i said well what will you do during those times she said well you know teach them how to take care of themselves teach them how to take care of the baby and she kept stressing cleanliness. And I was like, okay, so that's just, you know, our colonization through Britain where, you know, we bleaching down everything and we dirty. But that's not what she was what? talking about. I'm talking about that. Mm -mm. That's not what she was talking about. She was like, because it's very important so that they don't get sepsis. And I was like, well, 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 here we are in 2019 with women having whole pieces of placenta retained because we in a rush. In a rush. This is a business. Your baby come out. This placenta got to come out. And we on the clock. And you know what? Let me just go ahead and help it by just pulling Let me on that umbilical cord. Mm -hmm. Let me do some yanking. Mm -hmm. And oh, you know, like anything else, you know, that's delicate. You tear, you pulling on a piece of tissue with a, you know, on a string and you pull, maybe a piece will stay behind. And so now you see people, once again, sepsis, right? Yeah. You yeah. see that there is a lot that's going on, even inside of cesarean um, exactly. sections. Yes. I'm like, retain placenta How? in a cesarean? How? You're right there. You're like, and that's, that's the thing. That's, you know, I was, I think I was reading something just the other day where they were talking about um, yank, you know, the the placenta being yanked on to to get it to come, and you know that along with you know not allowing the blood to flow, you know, to the baby. So it's placenta is full of blood. It hasn't finished giving the baby all of its goodness, and now you're yanking it. All these different things that. To me, like when I started, when I listened, I said, wait a minute. Oh, so the placenta is still very full. Okay. And it's still, the cord is still pulsing and they're pulling. And I got this like, poof, this thing that said, oh, it was just like a, wait. Oh, so when it's finished doing this work, it's more likely to want to release on its own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, I think. I think the one. Th I think I heard it was almost forty percent of the baby's blood is still left. Blood in the volume, yeah, of the whole blood body, volume, yeah, of the whole body is left there in the placenta. So it's like the first blood transfusion a baby would get. And so I don't know why it never clicked with me before. I don't know why it didn't. But all of a sudden, I saw this just like in front of me. It was like, oh, placenta fl full of blood court still throbbing doctors pulling i was like no no wonder it's not no wonder it's not releasing no wonder it's you know there's so much going on and you make a great like some of those intuitive things we downplay them we mm -hmm. downplay them like it became a very, you know, I'm, you know, me, I'm like you, I'm educator by profession, you know, in my <laughs> thinking. and and all of a sudden it became this very like that makes that doesn't make sense. Why are they doing that? It just all of a sudden became a thing that didn't make sense, but that I could see. 
a, 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 an ancestral mother, our old, you know, our old mothers, I could see them thinking it and saying, well, if the blood is still coming through, then it, it just made sense on a natural level that I didn't need to, it, it just was like, oh, that makes sense. Why would you try to get this placenta to come? The cord is still pulsing. The It's still full of blood. No, it's not detached yet. Of course, you know, <laughs> you know, all of these things. And I love, love, love just the whole context of how you explain like the download of things. I have a friend, she always talks about, you know, she says, it's like God tells me things. And then I find out that science backs it up, you know, to the, I found out later. And that's what I hear you saying. I hear you talking about, well, you didn't say that. That's what I took from it. <laughs> it's like there, there are things that are happening. There are things that we've shunned for whatever reason. But as soon as someone says, this is, you know, like binding your belly. Girl, I talked to my daddy, had no idea. My daddy, I don't know why I didn't ask him more stuff before. I don't know why. I had Because he's a man. Exact prop, yes. That's it. Because he's a man, and we've been falsely led to believe <laughs> that because men may have not been in the birth room, which is exactly. which is facts, yes. okay, yes. that they somehow would not be keepers oh. of birth tradition. But let me tell you, they had mothers and they had, you know, aunts and cousins and and they saw this was not something that we did in secret that only came later on yes. because you know now you're trying to be on the under we with this is the underground railroad of birth that we're doing right now so it's like okay even as i sit here there's so many things that i have to say and share and i'm still measuring i'm still okay exactly. you know is is it the code switching that goes on or is it the the fear of you know, some sort of persecution. And because it, sometimes you ask yourself, is it me? Like, am I not built for this? Am I, is it that I'm, oh, this is some weakness showing. You don't realize this is your DNA talking. Yeah, this is. This and, is and mind you, we knew that for a long time. Yeah. They always, the elders always talked about how situations that took place with so-and-so's daddy was going to make a difference in their life, even though that child wasn't even born yet. So saying all that to say, why is it now that epigenetics has been, you know, the big focus of science proving mm -hmm. that, oh, you know what, there are actually markers on the DNA from trauma. And you know, the environment can actually bring out certain ailments based on those markers when there's a stress, when there is just unnecessary trauma that's happening in the present, it pulls forth that genetic recall, really, that computerized code to say, okay, we got to break down. We need to break down this part of the body. And, and that's what's taking us out of here because we're literally divorced from our family histories. Yep. Um, because certain family members have passed on who may have been the ones that you thought knew the information. But I'm gonna let you talk. I'm gonna let you tell me about your daddy because one of my students, she literally couldn't find some information that I was like, part of the course is that people have to go find their own history. Yes. And I knew I knew that it was going to be triggering. So like I start off, you know, with the assignments, kind of prepping you, kind of letting you know this work ain't it, it ain't gonna be quick and it ain't gonna and it ain't gonna be clean. It's it's gonna be dirty, right? So you're going to go and you're going to try to find something and you're not going to find it and you're going to get frustrated. Mm -hmm. But what I need you to do is just keep going. And so people will be like, but the assignment and, and you know, the due date. And I'm like, it's a self-paced course. So those <laughs> assignment due dates are just suggestions. You didn't get the information. No problem. Skip it. Go to the next one. They wanted me to be able to be like, oh, you know what? Um, you don't have to do that assignment. Okay. And I'm like, no, guess what? You're going to find it. I'm like, you don't have a friend you can ask. You don't, because my thing is also, we act as if you cannot uh, align yourself with someone else who did not have that break in exactly. their culture. You can do that. Like, no. that's what I'm literally doing. You think that all these remedies and recipes that I have, 
all my students have them? No, but I'm going to say, oh, by the way, this is my mother's postpartum That's soup right. recipe. Because now you can add that when you start putting that into p- to play. Now that becomes a part of your birth legacy for your family, because the next generation is going to be like, oh, yeah, my mother made such and such. This is how we share uh, that collective memory and those collective. Uh, it, it's like an heirloom. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is our literal wisdom that we have. So saying all that to say, I just think that, you know, we have to stop sleeping on these men. We have to stop thinking that, well, my mother passed away. My grandmother passed away. I don't have anyone I can ask. I'm not saying I don't have compassion towards that. But every single time you turn around, you hear somebody say, my father. Yeah. (laughs) Listen, he knew. Let me tell you, my um, I've had. I do the exact same thing in my San Code for Birth Ambassador Workshop, the mentoring I do. I say, go talk to the elders. And it's funny because many of them will go to the women first or they'll say, well, my grandmother, whatever. The, I can't tell you, there have been several who have found out that they had a midwife in their family because a great uncle that's 92 years old said, oh yeah, you're, you my grandmother, so your great great whatever was a midwife. I used to hide up under the bed, you know, before she left to see what she was getting, you know, what? And <laughs> all these revelations. When I asked my dad, I'd asked him about his mother because that was the only I only had my great aunt, and I and my and there are others that I can ask to that I'm trying to get to, but. I had my great aunt on my mother's side and then my my dad, I was, I said, daddy, what do you remember? He was the oldest. So he leaned back and he just started talking about what he remembered. He wasn't in the birthing room, but there were things that he saw. Like he saw, he said, I just remember they took this old sheet and they just wrapped mama as tight. They just wrapped hmm. so tight. I said, who, what? I said, the midwife. He said, well, no, it wasn't the midwife. It was the women. From mm-hmm. then, I mean, he started talking and just those little things. I said, wait a minute. And this is when I said, okay, if I'm going to be walking in this energy, like fully, we can't go with the model that majority culture has set up. You know, they disenfranchised, tore down what we had. And now it's like, okay, you can come, you can be a doula. Hmm. If you want to go further, you can become a midwife. But that's not what, see, that's not restoring and reclaiming. Because in our cultures, and I'll put an S on it, because we're not a monolith, but you can find it everywhere. That's right. It wasn't just one woman that knew, that one of them knew the soup. This is what you need to feed her afterwards. This is what you need to feed her before. The other one was, was saying, this is what, let me, I'm, I'm the one that rub on the women after I massage the mm. you know, see we all were collectively playing a part in something we knew the one who knew you know uh so and so she'll tell you the herbs to use it wasn't just right. the midwife it wasn't just her that knew and so then the mother said well this is what the midwife or whomever gave me Mm-hmm. And she said this would help with whatever and I passed that down and I passed that down it was never this framework that was set up and you mentioned before the healing mm-hmm. that came to me so strong that they can make every legislative change they want they can mm-hmm. do all the things they want but I started talking about the protectors of the womb mm. the womb men and the thing about it is that our midwives and our and the women, the other helpers, as I call them, right, <laughs> were spiritual people who understood that they were just the way I say it. They were assisting the Most High. They were assisting God. Mm-hmm. Chills. I got all the hair on. <laughs> if you could only see these goosebumps right now. Mm. They were assisting. Mm-hmm. They never thought that they were in the place of God. They never thought they knew they were not in control of that thing, but they knew they could be like a conduit, like an antenna. Mm. They knew that they could be the one that listened. And and if you listen, you would you would you would get an unction that says, "Well, look at her feet. 
Well, whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. What about this? See, that spiritual context made us, and a sister that I interviewed, she said, she says, I believed that I had, she had her home birth, and she said, I believed I had other protectors. Mm -hmm. and talk about, it's bigger than just whatever, you know, the medical field says that it can, it, it is, you know, whatever they have and whatever. How is it that people right. that did not, have the in many cases I know on my on my family you know nobody was over like a sixth grade education hmm. in my family how were these people that were deemed illiterate by many standards going back generations were able to assist this birthing pro process how were they able to do that that's the part that I believe that unless we embrace that as black women and understand that there were other things going on. That's what I, that's what I mean when I say we save ourselves because we're in that position to be able to hear, to do. If we follow the model that is set up for us, we will continue to die. That those words actually came to me. If we simply mm. follow the model that is presented to us, we will die because mm, mm, it's always mm, bigger mm. than us. And even when you talk about us sharing the culture and the heirlooms, as as people of of that have been intermingled and in things like that, we've we've shared knowledge all the time. <laughs> talk about it. I mean, it's what is the Caribbean? Exactly. What is the Caribbean? <laughs> most of, most of the, the people that went there. Were 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 went that came to the Western Hemisphere went to the Caribbean. All they did was mix and mingle. All we did was have to figure out, okay, this person just arrived here. You don't mm -hmm. know what it, you know what their practices were exactly. All we've done is mix and mingle our practices because that's what that's what part of this whole evil thing you want to talk about evil was evil part of that evil that was caused that that's called slavery and the transatlantic slave trade and all those things all it did was require us to do this but then look at all why, why is it that i can look at you know what flash flatbush doulas is doing you call it flatbush flatbush doulas yes mm -hmm. yes why can i look at what you're doing and see myself thank you my love thank you <laughs> Yes. Why can I look at what you're doing and see myself? Because there is a right. There's a thread that goes through all of it. And if you're not careful, and if you don't realize that it's bigger than you, you will get caught up. You will start to be like, "Well, what's Andrea doing? Because she must be taking my idea." Or you know, <laughs> like we won't actually realize that when the idea has to be born when you know the thing about it is is that the creator is about wisdom the creator yeah. is wisdom the creator is knowledge so when that knowledge has to be revealed it's all about who will take it you know who will take that that job so many of us have ideas but until you actually begin on the path to start bringing those ideas to fruition and sharing them out with the world, it will always seem like, oh, it's something that you have to hoard. Exactly. And it's something that we have. I understand the, the impulse to do it because you have to look at a people who were stripped. You have to look at a people who every time they had something, somebody got to come and take it from them. That's right. So even if you do that to children, eventually they will get very grabby. You know, they will be like, okay, no, you know, this is mine. Because there is this feeling of can't I have anything? But <laughs> as you mentioned, like about this mixing and this mingling, part of the work that has to be done is for us to separate what belongs to me and what belongs to you. And it doesn't mean that we can't share, but if it's all muddled and we don't know where it's coming from and we don't know the origin and the source, then we don't realize what actually will work for us. That's and right. so, you know, I remember during the days of um, 
you know, everybody uh, around Brooklyn getting into like the sacred woman movement with Queen of Fua. Yes. And, you know, we were doing a lot of juice fasting and all this stuff. And I would try, um, you know, wheatgrass, right? And I was like, man, this thing is not from my ancestors. Like, there is no way the smell of it, the drip, yeah. it did not feel good to my body. And that was like a bold statement one day. I was like at the juice bar, whatever somebody was getting, and they were like, ask me about it. I said, my, I said, my ancestors don't know nothing about that. I said, I've never seen that in the Caribbean. <laughs> Now that's not taking away anything from people who wheatgrass works for them. Yeah. But you know, we have to get to the point where we're able to, you know, intuitively, energetically, and then you can back it up with your research and your science and, and your, you know, your whole archaeological and ancestral breakdowns. But you have to be able to be like, no. You know, because when I asked my mother why did she make this postpartum soup out of you know, this very unassuming and humble grain, which people have been using for 3000 years or more. And it and is also mentioned biblically, you know, barley, which I have some in my hand. I'm sure I can't make it. I'm sure I can't make it that, the we, camera see, but you know, I got a few little grains of barley. There we go. Yes. Um, she's like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Did anybody make that for me? She had to think on it. Did she make up the recipe? But it's just so interesting that barley is a galactagogue. And, you know, as a certified lactation counselor, this goes back to also how some of the things that we align ourselves with will cause us to be in conflict. Because as a certified Ooh. lactation counselor, you cannot promote galactagogues. You cannot suggest teas and things like that to your clients and so forth and so on. And it's just because their whole mindset is you don't want people to think that they shouldn't be able to breastfeed unless they have something like you need this. Like you should be able to just adjust the positioning, adjust the latch. And for the most part, that will help the milk to replenish itself. And I agree. That's true. However, OK, however, am I going to just be like, oh, all these things that my ancestors or even my just so close as my mother However, she got that information. Do you think that when someone in my family is newly postpartum, you think I'm not going to ask my mother to make that um, soup or I'm not going to make it? There's not oh. one. There's not. And when I do my interviews for the Africa to the Diaspora um, birth and postpartum project that I do. All those societies, cultures, whatever, have something. I think it's the it's like the intent behind it. Like when we say, oh, we don't want them to think that they can't breastfeed without that. It's not, that's not, so even that context is not where we come from as indigenous people of cultures. It wasn't about that you won't be able to breastfeed unless you do this. It doesn't come, <laughs> just like you mentioned before, how scriptures talk about that a woman should be set apart for this amount of days. When I hear it in broad cultures, like, the men said they were unpure and they were unclean and they were shaming the women. So from this Western context, you're, you, you are, you know, and why is it 80 days for the, you know, for the, for the, for if, if she for the girls and only 40, it is, 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 is a uh, classic case of not honoring, you know, uh, a womanhood and why she have to be, what is the word? They weren't using isolated. They were using a very derogatory. Ostracized. Word. Yeah, ostracized. They were saying, you know, that she shunned, shunned, and and those like all these negative words that went with her having. She has to be away. She's considered unclean or un unclean. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's and it's all of these things though from the kind from. I'll say it this way: there's an Issy Zulu word. <laughs> And they were talking about uh, this postpartum time. And the word literally meant nothing at all with being unpure. But that was the word that the Europeans chose. They said it was a time of impurity. And the, mm -hmm. and the writer in the research I was reading even acknowledged that there was no reason why something that had been very sacred and this word that meant so much in Isi Zulu was called a time of impurification 
and um it's another p word that i can never remember but it's they were just saying that it's a defiled time and they couldn't even say why the in, that that in english it had been interpreted to mean something so negative a lot of times we are taking our cues in my opinion from this culture that we find ourselves in from whatever the majority culture is we're taking mm-hmm. our um no one i don't recall anybody fussing about all the doula organizations that white women have started <laughs> I don't I don't recall. I don't recall when they get, you know, um bright ideas about stuff, but you let you let well wait, we already have a black this. What does that mean? See, unless that's not our culture. There wasn't mm-hmm. any black person that we went to and that was the only option. There were this was our our culture was what we ate and lived and breathed and it was everything until we can get back to the place where a black woman can sit down and say, man, I looked at this, 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 and this, this, and this. And she got 25 options for black women right. that she can learn from and not one or not two. Cause that's all we're allowing until we get to that place. Now we are still abiding by what they say. They're the ones that said that magical Negro, that one black person. It will, if you're right. here, then there can only be one of us here at, at the same time. So if you're here, well, if she's coming, I like her better. Let's replace her. They did that hmm. to us. They positioned us in that way. And until we can celebrate everybody doing everything, let me tell you something, honey. <laughs> my course, the 10 things that every, what every, um, what every womb man should know about birth, what every helper should know about postpartum. Let me tell you what I tell them in there. My specific thing that I'm supposed to be answering is this notion that somehow when black women want to start learning, they have a hard time finding somebody to start learning with. Mm. Um, they're waiting for that trainer to come to the city. <laughs> their favorite black whoever. (laughs) (laughs) Oh boy. They're (laughs) waiting. In the meantime, well, and then there's my husband. My husband is like, listen, you sitting on this phone with these people. You they getting all of your whatever. Drea, just do, just do something. But let me tell you, what I tell them in there. I said, listen, I'm an introduction. That's it. There are sisters that are specializing. Right. Go find the ones that's going to- Monroe is out there. I mean, she's I, literally I, out I, there. She was my first- You know, friend. doing full- My first- You understand what I'm saying? She's doing full spectrum doula training. I, from this, this is so- 10 things is so you can stop making excuses for why you won't help your sister. And then we spend more time fussing about what the medical system is and is not willing to do. But we, I guess because, you know, historic, you know, we've forgotten what to do. Look, stop with the excuses. I loved your post last night. You was like, listen, you literally have no excuse. You just don't have any excuse to not know and to not be learning. And that's the thing. I'm just, listen, you want to know where to start? Start. Okay, here you go. But I tell them, I said, I have sisters like you that go deep. I don't go deep in there. And I used to have a problem with that. I'm, I am called to gather. I know my role. Mm. It. it used to be hard for me because I felt like getting started and committing to this work at 40. I said, y'all could have, I was homeschooling for 13 years. Look, right? Could have I could have been setting this thing up. I could have had like twenty some years in the game. No, no, you couldn't, because I'm homeschooling now, and I'm, I'm, I'm like, oh my goodness, just for just for me to have this interview, I'm, I'm I hearing know, so many feet I running know, over there in the hallway. It's <laughs> but it's like, it's like I'm looking and I'm saying, I could have been so, you know, I could have been more seasoned in this and everything. Mm-hmm. And all I kept receiving from my spirit was. All I want you to do is to gather them. Just gather. Yeah, you write where you need to be and you write who you need to be. Because your sisters, there are sisters like you who are going deep. 
And so I literally refer them to y'all. I sure do. I'm like, here's the link to her. Thank you. Here's the link to hers. Here's the link to this one. You feeling this? Here's some links. Here you go. Mm -hmm. Because you all are are doing y'all's thing so powerfully. I just, I'll just keep saying, unless we, unless we have options and unless we see ourselves everywhere, then the liberation that we are looking for, it'll continue to look like something that maybe you can get it as a black woman. Maybe, you know, maybe it's okay for them. No, until they see us. And they see that we are already doing this work. Oh, it's not just one woman that believes this. They're everywhere. And that's why I do the birth her story. Tell me this. If you had a piece of advice for, I don't know. If you had a piece of advice and you're like, let's see who I asked for your advice for. What do you what would you say to I don't know, I feel like for whatever reason, just the average black woman. Like what do you what do you what in your mind, the average black woman, what should you know, you mentioned yesterday, whether you birthing a baby or not birthing a baby, whether it's coming through you or not, in your mind, what does that look like? What would it look like for us to be in a space where we were in the right space as black women? I don't know why the first thing that came to my mind is like, y'all need to invite me and Andrea and folks like us to your book club, to your girls night in, to your um, women's auxiliary, like Calvis Williamson is always talking about, like getting into getting into what? churches. Like you have to go yeah. where black people are. And I know like we do a lot of networking and mixing and mingling. Like, you know, a lot of the generation that we deal with right now is about, you got to get the word out. But we don't have lasting relationships. We don't have lasting connections that would allow the information to actually be transferred. Like, I literally have not had a face-to-face or an audio conversation with you probably in probably in uh, two years, if not a year. Yeah. yeah. And about but it. But when we did talk, we talked for like eight hours. Like, it was a doggone job. Like, I need my paycheck from that conversation. But a lot of what we were doing, like, if we were together, mm-hmm. we probably wouldn't even have been talking. We because would, yeah. it's just a mutual appreciation society that we got going on when you realize that this person, she's me, you know, she is me. She's just me over there in Chicago. You know, I'm here, I'm her over here in, in Brooklyn. And I think that for the average black woman, a lot of the connectedness that we used to have, it all takes place on the internet now. So, yeah. you know, that's my living room where I sit and I chat. And so when I when I get fired up and I say those statuses that sound like she going off, she going yeah. in, it's but because now. if y'all was right here with me, <laughs> this is my soapbox. Like that's my actual soapbox. And everyone who's been my friend since I was probably 16, you know, I always had a soapbox about something. So sometimes you just become that person who is like, oh, she's going deep again. But the thing about it is, is that for the average black woman, what are the things that we want? You know, we all want a man, you know, <laughs> I'm like, tell the truth, you know, or, or not, right? The ladies who don't want men, right? Yes. But you all want a relationship. You yes. all want, you all want partnership. You all want to have some level of success in your career or in your art, your craft. And at some point, you know, the majority, except for the people who they know from a, you know, a pretty early enough time, they're like, no, I don't want to be a mother. It's a natural desire and it's a common desire for black Mm -hmm. women to want to be mothers. Mm -hmm. And for black women who want to be mothers for their whole experience in that to be something that starts out being jaded. Starts out being worrisome, starts out feeling unsupported, starts out feeling guilty. 
Like, you know, like you would think we were in China because if people start having more than, I mean, you know, you have four children. Girl. So it's like, oh, ain't that enough by now? So there is so much opinion around black women's uterus. Okay. And most of it is not our own opinion. Most of us don't have a, a, a perfect understanding of that. And, you know, so for that person, I would say, look for the the mentorship or the inspiration that you identify with. Exactly. I know there's going to be people who identify with me because they're like, oh, you know, I used to live in Brooklyn. I get that a lot. Or, oh, I'm mm -hmm. second generation, you know, Caribbean. Yeah. Or I like how you always are straight about stuff. Right. Like they, there are certain people who they like direct communication. And then right. there's other people who they're like, OK, um, I don't need so much of the history or right. the science of it. Right. I need more hands on. I want to know how certain herbs and so on. And I'm like, well, go see Divine. Exactly. Because, you know, I don't know if I'll ever create a course that will just be on herbs inside of the course that I teach. We yeah. do go over some, you know, some very potent, actually, um, especially preconception and things like that, because I just find that for me, I want to get to a space where I know there's never going to be a time there's no trepidation, but I feel like every time I get ready to do something or say something, I'm checking in too many times. Yeah. Oh, what, what's the Israelites going to say about this? Oh, what's the, what's the medical folk going to say about this one? Oh, oh, what's, you know, and I'm doing all of this stuff. And at the same time, if the message was not for me to give, I don't think it would just keep coming repeatedly, repeatedly. And so my thing is find the person or persons. You might start out with an organization. You might start out with a particular person, but find where you feel like, oh, I want that. And then you have to really start pursuing it. Like we are so lazy when it comes to scholarship. And I hate to use the word lazy and, and black people in the same sentence because God knows if we never work another day, our ancestors, <laughs> they paid it all. They did it all. We know that that's true. And even now today, we're still holding up so many companies and so on. Exactly. But I'm talking about intellectual laziness. I'm talking about even the spiritual laziness. You know, I, I'll out myself first. You know how I'm always like, oh, my prayer life. Because, you know, we find so many things to do rather than the things. We want all the things that, you know, with the bells and the whistles. And it's like, yes. But did you pray about it? <laughs> they ask you, did you pray about it? You'd be like, you'd be looking to pray. Pray where? Like, about what? you know, but sometimes you have to just go to the basics. You know, I, I know I grew up hearing people be like, oh, my spirit don't take her. I mean, what does that mean? You know what I'm saying? Like your spirit, sometimes your spirit don't take these people. And it's okay. Like you don't have to. We're not in a place where my mother was at. That's right. You know? where she didn't have a choice. If she didn't like someone or something, she still had to just suck it up buttercup because this is the only way for me to get to my dream. You have choices, y'all. I mean, you got Andrea over there with the whole Kyrie shell. You know what I'm saying? You got me with the whole, you know, Ghana situation, embroidery. You got Divine. I mean, she in the Louisiana dirt. Like, I mean, yes. you, know, you got so many different variations on what it is that you like. But at some point, you got to sit down and listen to somebody. And as much as I love my sisters, we have had such a hard time just struggling for our personhood that sometimes our listening skills are just not, you know, they're not what they could be. And so for you to learn from someone, you have to take yourself out of it and be like, you know what? They have something to teach me. They have something that and then once you get that. You can go remix, you can go add, you can get somebody exactly. else's. But you know, get no go ahead. Get the things that you that you want from the place that you're gonna feel comfortable. Because, like I said, all medicine ain't sweet. So you're gonna get a bitter truth no matter who you go to, because that is a part of the learning process. Sometimes you get so excited. You know, my friend got me um a book, which this this is not on the birth topic, but Popular words and phrases yes, in Grenada yes. dialect. Yes. And I mean, you know how we get down. You know how you and I get down with the, with the linguistics. But um, 
I almost couldn't get through the book because I am like so excited inside as I read. And I find that's what would happen to me anytime I was really interested in something. I'm like, is this adult ADD? Like, what is this that's happening? (laughs) But, you know, that's something that you have to plan for. You have to realize, like, you know what? I have to get through this. I have to calm myself enough, center myself enough to be able to complete it. So I give credit to the sisters who come into my course. You know, like I, I'm quoting Calvis and she's like, girl, this is a whole college course. Yes. Because my thing is like, you know, I don't want you to walk away and be like, oh, you know, I paid for whatever. And she didn't really tell us, you know, like it was just her telling stories about, you know, people drank this herb and they got pregnant or whatever, you know, <laughs> like I do a whole preconception nutrition plan. I also, you know, I also offer that as a service. I have a client. um that I'm working with right now on that, where literally I'm just giving you menus, like, okay, breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks, drinks. And then you have like that coaching with me. I mean, I never thought that my life would be like me literally sitting here like, okay, so like, what are you wearing to go to your, to sleep? Like, you know, like who thought I'm like me of all people, like, but it's all of it. It's all of it. Like you have to realize that Like you said, those women who knew the information, it wasn't one woman and it was something that was communal and we were of like mind, like at a certain time we know, oh man, look at the time I got to go put my pot on or at a certain season. It's like, you start to clean them children out yet. You know, it's time to go back to school. And so you got your morbid fixed up or, you know, your sorrel and the blood purifying and all of that. So my thing is like. All I want to do is share with people that our ancestors' wisdom and our ancestors' science, whether any Europeans ever confirmed it or not, ever that it's real, that it existed for a reason, they wouldn't keep doing something if it didn't work, y'all. Like even what you said about the placenta, you were like, oh, somebody probably looked at it and realized the blood. I'm like, you know what, even simpler than that, maybe they didn't even know there was anything else in there with the baby. And maybe while you just had your baby, then something else came out. And that's when they first realized, oh, that thing is attached to the, okay, so now they know if you wait around, it'll come out. And if you massage her, you know, her belly and that uterus. And the thing about it is, is that, you know, I think a lot of times when we get into these conversations, it sounds like we're just like, forget about Western medicine, anything that happens you know, sprinkle myrrh on it. It's not that that's what we're saying. Like I live in Brooklyn. God forbid I ever get shot. God forbid bad things. Well, take me to Kings County. Like that is the trauma hospital. You want to go, a Western uh, hospital is great for trauma. Uh It's great for trauma. Yes. But having a baby is not traumatic until it's traumatic. Until it's traumatic. So, you know, Pretty much, you want to go with normal physiological birth. A a part of the issue of why a lot of times I feel like a little bit of hesitation in, um, you know, like taking on that role of of being that healer and of being that person is because a lot of our sisters are dealing with some pre-existing conditions, whether it be the fibroids, whether it be um, some mental health and mental wellness issues, anxiety, things of that nature. Um, hormonal imbalances. So by the time you become someone who's working with a birth client that's right, and you think you're telling them, oh, this is fine. You should do this. You should do the other. You really don't have any idea of this person's medical history. Mm-hmm. And so now what you might be telling her might actually be unsafe exactly. for her. Exactly. So a lot of that was the reason why like, there would be a lot of second guessing in addition to what's always playing in all of our minds, which is our ancestral science, is it really real? And is this illegal what I'm doing? Because you have to realize that our ancestors were persecuted for these very reasons. And even when you talk about the concept of, um, you know, women as dirty, women as isolated and shunned and so on. um, When people don't live in a society where ritual is not only accepted, yes, but 
commonplace and understood, then you separated by centuries of being cut off. And now you pick up this ancient document and you start to read it with, you don't have a Hebraic understanding. You don't have a, a Hebraic cultural mindset. And let's face it, they've told you you're not even the Hebrews because the face of a Jew worldwide ain't you. Mm -hmm. But that's for another topic on another day. So, uh, you know, you're looking at this thing and you're like, oh, this is very exclusive because, you know, look at it. And it is, you know, these Europeans who translated and it is da 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 da. But then if you go a little deeper, and I had the benefit of attending a talk by an elder by the name of Yasuda Yehuda, who is, you know, one of my matriarchs in the in the Hebrew community here in New York. And she did this lecture about Genesis. And she basically said something that, you know, was very unique in the sense of most times when we read biblical history and literature, we kind of have the idea that everything happened exactly the way that it's supposed to be because, you know, this is God and, and God would, would change it if it wasn't supposed to go that way. Yeah. And she put out the idea that, you know what, it was never supposed to go down like that. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and that, and that actually, um, you know, immortality really was the, the goal or the idea, you know, that was out there. So if we go with that, when you look at when the law is being given and the different instances, because people only seem to know the instance of a woman and her menstruation. Yes. And, you know, recent, recently people started to know about the separation for women and, po and postpartum. Mm -hmm. For some reason, they never bring up when men have to be separated because the sperm has left their body. But I digress. <laughs> so that actually is a part of a commemoration that life actually yes. was lost. If we are going on the history that states that these beings were supposed to live forever and because they did not do what they were supposed to do to secure that living, they had to have a finite life. So all of us have finite lives now. So every time you come in contact with a bodily function that harkens back to the fact that we are not yeah. immortal yeah that time is a time of separation yeah. not as a punishment right. but as a memorial wow. and almost like a form of honoring and even a little grief yeah. that you know what we were supposed to live forever and and look we don't so here you are you have when a man's sperm leaves his body that could be a night a nocturnal emission, or that could be the act of intercourse. It doesn't matter. He is now deemed ritually, quote unquote, unclean. Mm -hmm. And how does he go about cleansing himself? It's, everything always goes back to water. Every, you see, the thing about it is, is that people don't realize that when you have a society, you have to teach cleanliness and you have to teach sanit 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 sanitary practices as well. You know, you have to teach people, yo, when you're sick and we don't know what's wrong with you, we're going to isolate you, Yeah, you know, and until the priest can come and identify what it is. So the priest in the Hebrew society, he was a medic. You know what I'm saying? Like he had, he had a lot of things to do. So it's not surprising to me that these two midwives had other skills aside from yes. just being able to identify when a woman is in labor and so on. And then the other thing is that where we where where the information was given, right? When when they answered uh, Pharaoh when he said, "Well, why didn't you kill those boys?" And, oh, because well, the Hebrew women are lively. My thing is, what if we took on, took that on today? What if we still realize that we're lively and that we actually have the capacity? Because by all means, our whole nation should have been wiped out by now. Let I mean, I don't know any other people who have had just such, you know, systemic attack after attack after attack. And we still here. I mean, you know, the brother Robin Harris, may he rest, baby's kids, like yeah. we don't die, we multiply, right? Like we just keep coming back. And the thing about it is, is that if we become so naive and not connected to whatever that source is, yes, we will not see when we are coming back. Like we won't realize what that call is. We won't realize, you know, who those children are, 
that you should identify and be like, you know what? I got to let sis know that yeah. her daughter is probably going to be one of the ones. Hey, come on, girl. Mm. You know, like I look at my daughter, I was getting ready for this interview and she want to be in here so bad. And I'm like, you're going to see, I'm quite sure I'll get a link. I'll let you see because she's like, I got to get this information. But I mean, this is a child who I taught a, a basic childbirth education with a leg warmer and a doll. Come on. And I'm like, this is the uterus and it's squeezing it down. And this is how the baby comes out. And this will be the service. Because it's it's literally that simple and it's that natural and normal. And if we start normalizing it and making it be a part of our culture, that's not something that we are, you know, ashamed of or yeah. afraid of. Imagine the type of renaissance that would happen. So, uh, you know, just to just to recap, there is a reason for separation in terms of separating people based on their bodily emissions. And it all has to do with how your status changes throughout your human experience that would either make you fit to step before the creator on behalf of the people or on behalf of yourself and make you not fit. Even when it came to war, the Hebrew nation was told, make a spot for where you're going to relieve yourself and cover it over. We're not a people who just, you know, would, would squat and leave that. And it was because why? Because I want to be close to you, but I can't be close to you in your uncleanness and in your, you know, what is it's translated as in your filth. But I think that we are so, like I said, we're so oppressed that yeah. when we see anything that says you cannot, you, yeah, that spirit of rebelliousness and rejection comes out of us because we're like, oh no, this is what they use to oppress us. And I'm not saying they didn't. I'm not saying they didn't. But I'm also saying, what I am saying is that you're not going to make me let go of my culture because you used it to oppress me and oppose me. And you're not, cause that trick been going on for so long. Yeah. Right. Like in every group of people, whether it be the native Americans, yeah. it doesn't matter who you are. And then, then they'll turn back around and then sell you, you know, something else and tell you like, this is why you need to get this rap, this Moby rap. Oh my God. Or whatever. And I'm like, listen, I've been knowing how to tie a piece of fabric and a baby on my back before I even had children. You know, you know, what's funny. Women in Grenada was carrying things on their head. And, you know, I tell I tell people who have ancestry here in the United States, I tell them all the time, you know, as a mark of just how cruel this country has been towards black women, you can find and trace very easily just about every other birth, postpartum practice and everything else. But the one of carrying their baby, mm. you can't, it, it's hard to find. And then I talked to my great aunt who's 92 and she was telling me, cause I'm, I'm like, she's like, I'm, I was a sharecropper. We were working for white men, blah, blah, blah. They down in Alabama, whatever. And mm -hmm. I said, did you, I, 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 I had a hard time understanding when I said, how did you carry your babies? For years now, she would just say, you just carry them in your arms. Mm -hmm. just I mean, with everything else that she was giving me, I was like, how are you just carrying your baby in your arms? And eventually, um, you know, when you're talking to the elders and you mentioned that before, they are willing to share, but they're not going to force it on you. And so right. I'm asking the questions in different ways. And I said, well, what did you do with your baby while you were working in the cotton field? Mm. She said, laid I laid them down in a basket, left them in a box under a tree. Mm -hmm. And when I came around, and, and what she said, when I came around, I would see if the baby was awakened and I could feed the baby. And then she said, it wasn't even that bad. You know, back then, the ants didn't even bite them that much. That's, you know, that that's when I have to kind of take, you know, like make sure I'm not, mm. you know, you, know, you got to sit, you know, sit with that for a second that you're talking about ants biting your baby while you work because, and I said, well, I, I was, I was confused. I was conflicted. I was confused. And I said, well, why is it that in the Caribbean, you can find people carrying their babies. You can find it everywhere. You can find it everywhere, South America, everywhere. But the United States, these people here were so cruel and so evil. 
that it was almost like we had to stay in a state of ready that they would take our babies from us at any time. They didn't even want that kind of bonding. I have not found, mm -hmm. you see, see, that's the one thing. And then when I talk to women about it, a lot of, a lot, lot, lot of women that have ancestry here that where their people have been here have a fear. And I've seen that translate to the babies where mm -hmm. the fact I can't see my baby. Mm -hmm. And I, I work to really help deconstruct that because a lot of the work, like when we talk about, you talk about all the time, self-care, a lot of the things that we need to do, our African, the mothers before us, they've been having to do it. Black women been having to do it. Everybody's been having to do it all over the world. But somehow we, I got to see my baby. Why? What are you mm. afraid of? I, I tell them, I said, okay, I need us to to let's let's take this a loose. If you know, in the United States, they say ladies first. That's the you know, mm -hmm. what ladies first. In what world do the protectors let the most vulnerable go first? Mm -hmm. So when we talk about it's fine to carry your, your baby in the front. My South African mom, she says, look, if you're carrying your baby in the front, you're not working. <laughs> carrying your right. baby so you can work. It's so you can go on with your life. It's so that your baby can be close to you and you can move on with your life. That's a signal. And many cultures that it's like, okay, I'm I'm here again. You know, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. back to myself. But there are so many, not only have I found that Black women uh, here are afraid to carry on their back because they can't see their baby, even though mm -hmm. they're the protector, the protector would go first. So like if I'm cooking and I got my baby on the front of me, right. The water pops on the baby, right? Mm -hmm. the degree, oh, everything gets to the baby first. Protectors go first. Right. And I've seen this in even cultures where the men walk first. This is another thing where people come from a Western perspective and say, look at him. He's so rude. That woman has to walk behind him. Just not in context at all. If right. you're walking as a protector, then you are walking first because unless you're going through a glass door where you can see everything that's coming, you don't know what will be encountered when I walk through this place. So I'm mm -hmm. whatever comes first, right? So I always deconstruct that and, and try to work. But I also find that babies are afraid to not see their mother's face. And mm. I look at that and I say, okay, there's some trauma. There's something going on here that's bigger than just, you know, oh, I, you know, I, I want to see my mom. This is, this is bring. I mean, have seen a baby terrified, just terrified. But if you threw just, just that whole thing. I wanted to make a comment about your daughter, and I love it. When you talk about how simple things are and how, you know, how you simply taught her. I love that because, as you know, and the way you teach as well, I saw one of your students that commented about how she was ready to teach her daughter as well. The. A lot of times we do and you mentioned not. Um, necessarily being all like, oh, I'm a healer. Let me show you how to heal this and that because you don't know what people come to you with. And that's one of the things that, um, that's one of the re the things too. And one of the reasons why I tell them, I said, I'm not going to sit up here and tell and prescribe this, 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 and this to you. And I'm not going to give you that. I'm going to point you in a direction. Now you go and you study and you research because it's not just about, it's not just about doing stuff. It's about us understanding and really regaining the skill to know how to be resourceful with ourselves. The other side of that, too, is even if these moms, you know, know Black women are not being celebrated. Black women, you mm -hmm. know, I asked a sister the other day, she thought her daughter, who's not married, was pregnant. And so she was like, I don't know. And da da da. And, you know, so, so and so's going to say this and that. And I told her, I said, Do you know? I said, do you know how often I have not heard white women say, oh, no, so-and-so is pregnant out of wedlock? Oh, no, whatever. I said, 
when I had my baby within the first year, I was married. They said, man, you got pregnant already. When I had my next one within like um, two years later, they said, wow, so y'all finished now? You gonna have any more? When I had the next one five years after that one, and wow, oh man, so now y'all got three. Surely y'all are finished now. And no, there's always a reason. And I did learn this from Shafia Monroe. She said, black women are not celebrated. The fact that we historically have been able to procreate so easily. But things that people will say that are negative. And I told her, I said, whether Mm -hmm. whether your child is is married or not married, she's a grown woman, whether she's married or not, if they want to say something negative, they're going to say it. And I told her, I said, but you, you are You are her mother. You're the one that she shared this with that she thought she might be. So how are you going to respond? Will you celebrate the ability of her womb to reproduce? Will you celebrate that? And when I hear you talking about your daughter and how you're teaching her and all these things, and then knowing that we encounter women who have these other issues that have done things, you know, perhaps they say they're no, they're no, um, side effects to contraceptions. Okay, fine. Um, That's a pregnant pause right there. That's it. That's what that was. Um, However, okay. And so women have these issues and black women have these issues that they didn't have necessarily before. As much and as widespread. What I always think is I look at I look at you talking about your daughter because I actually talked to somebody. I said, don't you think, you know, she works in birth and everything. I said, don't you think your daughter will come to you? You've taught her about her body and everything. Don't you expect your daughter to come to you as the woman to tell her, you know, to help her? Oh, I don't know. I sure hope so. I was like, sis, wake up. Come on. This is what we're doing here. This is part of who we are. You know. Maybe at the level where the women are, they they have had situations. There are things that they have to navigate. But these daughters coming in and coming through, we can prepare them in a different way. We can prepare them in a different way. We can teach them more about what we allow to be put in our body. You know, we we can we can be corrective in this. And that is the hope that I see really more than anything um, for black women is that maybe there's situations that the mom is going through, but when the mom is learning from people like you, when the mom is learning these, these, you know, preconception things and learning all these things that, that she was like, Oh, I didn't know that. Right. Realize that. And that she can do, she can teach her daughter that this, these are the things, because this womb is such an intricate part. These are some of the things that I have, you know, that I, that I should be mindful of with my body. So it might take, I mean, it didn't take a generation for us to to lose a lot and it might take a generation or so to get it back. But I think that we're on that trajectory. And I just wanted to say to you, sis, let me tell you something. When you talk about checking in with everybody, I girl, I literally, checking in, okay, when I do this, is this that, is this the other? And what's these, this one gonna, think on what how is that one and is this one gonna think that and the other I just want you to know that that is a shared situation <laughs> situation it is like that and I'm being honest because hopefully there will be other black women that have decisions to make about the role they will play it is challenging when you have these people that can type stuff behind a keyboard and they don't have to own up to nothing. See, like when you say something, we know y'all is ready, but like, I'm, I'm here, I'm here. Like what? You said, I said, <laughs> <laughs> she said what she said, well, I'm here. But it's like, you know, I had, I had uh, made a comment, I've done a post that said, you know, when I put black women in IG and Facebook won't allow me to um, do an ad if I have black women. And wow. yes, I posted that yesterday. And the third comment said, why would you just want to market to black women? So I had to go. Well, the good part is that you would sit down and educate them. <laughs> Cause me, I'll be like, and goodbye. It was nice having your friendship. <laughs> so of course, you know, in my good fashion, the way I do, 
I explained and I asked, I said, are these, are these the same? I said, well, first of all, I don't understand because those are options when you're advertising. We all right. have graphics. And I said, but I don't hear anyone say that about the Latin Latina community. No one says that about no. the community. No one said those things. And I said, so, you know, I want black women to know I'm talking to them. And I, you know, and you taught me that, by the way, and thank you for that. You were like, sis, you was like, sis, you, you better tell them that you are talking to them. But we, that goes back to what I was saying about how we have been so like bombarded yes. with, you know, you should think this, you should be this. Don't think that don't be that. Now, when people are talking, we've gotten to a point of desensitization and just letting stuff go over us. That when someone's talking to us, we be sitting there like, mm, mm, and you're like, oh, me? You talking to me? <laughs> I did it in your, I did it in your presentation. I literally <laughs> did it in your presentation <laughs> at a conference. This one today, black one. Wait, on the front row, on the front row. Wait, are you talking to me? Just said it. I was, this, this one right here. I said, look, because we are so accustomed to having to find our in majority culture. Like, find where you fit in. Find the page in the book that talks about you. Oh, girl. Those books. In the history book. Um, a chapter, chapter 17 on page, you know, section three mentions black people. Uh, we have to find the section that says this. We got to find the section that says us. We are not accustomed to the whole book being, the whole text is us, you know? Right. Inside you'll find our diversity. You'll find our Caribbean roots. You'll find what happened in the South. You'll find what happened in the North. You'll find all these pieces, but the whole thing is us. And we don't have, we have not had that privilege in this majority culture, but they have. And mm -hmm. they don't understand, many of them, some of them, whoever, why in the world would you want to single it, single out black women? Because what they have told us was, you are just a part of this thing. You don't have any culture. Of your you own. Are, you have American culture. And that's all that, no, 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 no. I have culture. I have culture that survived. I mean, we act like it's just like 500 years ago that they decided, okay, you can drink from the same fountain as me. Do you get what I'm saying? It's not right. that long. And we act as me, if that's so hmm. long ago. Why would you want to bring up these, these things? Because my daddy remembers. My daddy remembers serving in the military and at a certain point he had to go to the back of the bus because they were going to cross a certain line. Mm. Okay. So as long as as long as he's still telling stories and I and our elders are still telling those stories, and as long as they still remember it, then it's still real and it's still here. And I'm gonna keep telling it. So it's gonna remain real because no other people has been asked to forget. Not a single one. But we are and I have to sorry. No, I'm finished. Go ahead. No, I, I was saying I have to um you know I have to say thank you to your father and to you and to all of the African people who were on these shores because what it was that you went through for you to still exist and then still create and still have culture and still have hospitality okay because when you talk about that southern hospitality and that's not white folks we're talking about no, not at all so to still have you know and, and i know i know it's like oh she make everything about the bible but no. like <laughs> that is the hallmark of our father abraham was that it was about hospitality. Yes. And I have to say thank you to your people because when Caribbean people came to these shores, a lot of the opportunities that they were able to have, the people who were already here had so many struggles, yes. so much oppression. Yes. And there was like a... Um, a seed of enmity that was planted so that we would never 
Come truly through. appreciate your contribution and your struggle. And we would more so be like, well, what's wrong with those people? Because we couldn't recognize how your trauma had actually informed your every way of life. Mm -hmm. A lot of it had to do with the fact that, you know, people were so kept in the dark here that they didn't even have a working understanding that y'all did rebel. Yeah. You know, the docile slave was so promoted here mm -hmm. and so the norm and so, you know, presented that people really sit here and think that it was only Nat Turner <laughs> and Harriet Tubman. And we're talking about insurrection after insurrection. You know, the terrain is different for various reasons that they didn't, it, it failed. Yeah. So you don't have a maroon society. You don't have where, you know, that in Jamaica and places like that, where people literally were able to go and obtain freedom and sovereignty. So now when you start realizing that those people are reproducing and we have a certain air of, of freedom, you know, and of we do what we want kind of thing. We come in contact with people who they're literally the people who should not exist because their ancestors were so, you know, like, I mean, it's so hella deep, you know? Yeah. So now we come in contact instead of being like, oh, you know what? You know, the warrior class is now meeting the people who have been the prisoners of war mm. and we need to acclimate them, you know, back and, and let us get together you find, not by accident, mm -hmm. you find there being some, you know, pitting those two people against each other. Very and me, as the child of Caribbean parents who was born here in America, you know, I always felt like I was a liaison, yeah. right? Like, <laughs> like I was a, like y'all, I've been a liaison for years, okay? Like, so this doula thing, going into hospitals and being able to be, you know, explain and be... Like, this is just who I was, you know, this is the life I was born into. And I would go to school and I would see how I'm talking and the children would take what I'm saying literally. And I was using my colloquial dialect, um, not because I was born in the Caribbean, but because I wasn't raised by wolves. Like my parents spoke to me the way they spoke. And then I spoke the way they spoke. So I'm in school and I said, give me the bloody pencil, you know, like, you know. <laughs> And they're like, there's no blood on this pencil. And I'm like, oh yeah, why do we say that? Like, why do we say that? You know what I mean? And then I would hear my parents or my family members, they may be saying something that didn't have, you know, quote unquote, African-Americans in a good light. And I'd be like, but that's not really true. Like you just, so the thing is, it's like when you actually get around the different parts of your family tree, Okay, because this is the same family. We just got dropped off in different That's ports. It. Okay. That's it. Same. And you start to realize, like, oh, they do that thing, like how Auntie So and so does. Then you start to realize that this idea that you had that we were separate and there was some reason why you shouldn't connect with those people, that it was all part of the larger divide and conquer and plot, you know, of those people who didn't mean you any any good. And so to those white women and those white birth workers on our timeline, y'all already know, don't ever come for me. Y'all already know. <laughs> I didn't call you. <laughs> I didn't call you. I, I would not send for you. Okay. You already know. But if by some, you know, strange chance you sit there and you see certain things, just absorb, exactly. you know, just absorb. And just feel grateful for the privilege to be in that space. Yeah. Because we do not owe you any allegiance or any friendship. We can be friends. We can be, you know, associates. We can be friendly. But you're not entitled to any intimacy with us. And I think that that's something that we have never seen as much as we see in this time. Is that's Black people really gathering all the edges and letting people know my intimate space is my intimate space. And even on social media, this is like you in my living room and to come into my living room, you got to take off your shoes. And if you don't want to do that, then there's the door. And they're not used to it because we are talking about their DNA also resonates with the fact it that your ancestors had to step off the sidewalk when they walk by. 
You're talking about in 2019, they having whole challenges, talking about the whole your space challenge. See if you could spend a whole day without moving out the way for white people. I mean, these are whole cha- these are whole challenges that are experienced. And so I say the same thing in reference to our spirituality. If the only way that you know how to experience, you know, this this book, this this Bible, this Tanakh, this Hebrew scripture, if the only way you know how to experience it is through the lens yes. of, <clears throat> you know, a white God and of white people giving this to you or or oppressing your ancestors with it. First of all, you would never realize that the origin of everything on the earth is going to be black people. I don't care what system it is. There is nothing that starts without us. And they tell you that with their science. They tell you that with Lucy. I mean, they already told you the oldest ancestor of all humankind was a black woman. So I don't know how come we still sitting here acting like when I take on and I say, yes, you know, this is me. Like I I recognize this is me over there. You know, I am Yisrael. I shouldn't feel any type of way of somebody going to say to me, but you're not European. Because in other words, neither was they in the desert. Exactly. So, you know, once I realize that this is actually mine, then I have to now take off those Western lenses. And when I see something like a law of separation for impurity, for whatever bodily discharge, I have to say, oh, this is something that was given to me for health and safety. And if I see that semen falls under that category, menstrual blood, as well as postpartum. Mm. I'm going to dig deeper into postpartum because I'm going to say, wait a minute. If all of these things symbolize death, because a sperm leaving your body and a baby did not form, get, did not get fertilized, that's a dying. Those sperm were actual potential lives. An egg leaving your body and it did not get fertilized, it symbolized death. A placenta also symbolizes death we were not taught that but when you think about it it's a whole organ y'all it's It's a whole whole organ organ. and it's a temporary organ and it doesn't it's no longer needed it has left your body and it has died so now that renders you into a different status than somebody who did not have that experience and I know that we want to always be there for everything I know that black women are you know just always being these super women and so on. But even when you did, even when you look in the scriptures at the census that was done for war, you had to start separating certain people. Yeah. Oh, if that man just, you know, if he just took on a wife, you know, he can't go to war. That's right. Let, let him stay home. You know, oh, this one, oh, that one. Oh, if he just bought a house. So my thing is, why do you, as someone who just had a baby, who literally you have an injury in your body because they want to tell you that birth is a medical uh, event, but they don't want to tell you that you're injured after. So I'm going to be the one to say it because it, because I know we don't want to, you know, we don't want to put women in those states where they have to say that, you know, uh, our job security is at risk because we just had a baby. So therefore we're injured. I know this is a whole thing that we go through now. It's a double entendre. We're not able to actually say what our, what we're going through because of fear of, repercussions and retribution but in reality you're injured do i want postpartum women to be on the front line in any war with me no i mean let's face it if if i really wanted any women to fight at that time it would be menstruating women but that's another conversation (laughs) if if i wanted you to fight but even when you're even when you have your, your menstrual cycle it's the time of separate it's a time for you to actually rest like but you live in a society where everything is like oh you see a tampon commercial and it's like go swimming do this do that do the other and then exactly (laughs) you know you wonder why reproductive health is at stake right now and these are the same people who told you going back to the person you were mentioning who you know is having the baby and so on and her mother was singing what do people think these are the same people who, who told you go to school study get a job do all these things and then you get married and then you'll have a baby. And guess what? When those women went and got ready to have a baby, they found out that they were infertile and not because they had any actual issue, but because their window of opportunity as someone who maybe they got their menstrual cycle at 12 and now they're 37 
and they're ready to have a baby. And it's just so many of them that have already left their body. It's just numbers, y'all. So I'm not saying that, you know, there's no way or that I can't, you know, sit here and help you prep your body with a preconception nutrition plan and tell you all the herbs. And so I absolutely can. At the same time, I do want you to be wise about why you're making certain life choices, That's because right. a lot of what we have been socialized to think it's something that's for today. Those same people's ancestors, those same people in the 50s was getting married at 18. Yes, they were. And Husbands her- was getting a job straight out of high school. They was having six children. Yep. No problem. Families were able to support themselves. People got more from the jobs that they were working at. People's families supported. Like you didn't have your mother being so like, okay, I'm just going to be afraid. You had your father talking about, well, are you going to marry my daughter? You understand what I'm saying? Because there's there's ways around this. We're not saying that everybody's supposed to just get a free pass and you're going to be left alone to be a single parent. But, you know, in the event that that is the case, realize that there's no such thing, that you're still a part of a community and you have to draw that to yourself. You know, Flatbush doulas, we're doing our part. We have labor doulas, postpartum doulas, African belly binding, meal planning and prep, childbirth education. You know, the House of Shifra and Pua is is a thing. Like, I'm about to start graduating people who took this course. Like, this is going to be, you know, really something. Um, Listen, I'll I'll teach y'all about any kind of herb. Listen, I got my bucket right here. You know, this is, these are the kind of, these are the kind of, can y'all see this? Yeah. The old enamel bucket, you know, with that wooden handle. Like, this is what this is what we squatting over after we have these babies. Like, I'm making the herbal blends and everything for you to do the postpartum womb steaming. But you have to show up. Like, you have to show up and be active in your healing and in your reproductive process. Like, the same way you go to the dentist. The same way that you get your hair done. The same way that you do your nails. You know, like... What if that was a part of our everyday life, the self-care of our womb, you know, how we deal with stress, knowing what your family history is, knowing that this racist environment will provoke you to have preeclampsia if that is something that you're prone to deal with. You know, when Shafia Moreau was talking about doulas doing blood pressures, yeah, I had the conversation with you. I was like, I don't know, Andrea. I don't know about that. And you was like, when these women stop dying, that's when I'm going to be worried about whether or not it's out of scope. But for right now, we all need to know what's your normal? Like, what is your baseline what's- blood pressure? Like, I know my blood pressure is is Gucci. Like, it's very cool. It's, it's, you know, so if my blood pressure was to ever be out of the range, I would know. But some people don't even know that their normal is already high. And so they're already predisposed to have in this these racist, issues. In this racist, in this white supremacist, in all of this, and we just... Microaggressions. Yes. And we're just trusting whatever the systems are telling us to do. And that's my biggest thing. We just have to stop acting like and for the life of me, I can't understand. We have to stop acting like that <laughs> inclusion in a medical system 60 years ago means when, when everything before was antagonistic, we were the experiments. We were experiments. The, but now because of law, because, you know, in the United States, a lot of times God is law. You know, that's what God is, whatever they sign. So, a mm. law, oh, yeah, my husband and I figured that out a, a while ago that there people might not say it but god and what is right is wrong right and wrong is whatever is signed into law and so mm-hmm. people act as if somehow god changed something just because some men signed something into law and that is not what happens so if you don't have an understanding of what our protectors had the connection that they had if you don't come with that and you go into these medical environments and you're just totally like, okay, I'm here. Our ancestry doesn't even tell us to go and relax in a medical setting and everything will be wonderful. <laughs> so where are we getting that from? That is us assimilating into a, a, a belief system for pe- of people that it was designed for. It was designed for right. to be able to do that. But okay, as you know, we could talk forever. 
you know no, but I gotta say this. I I gotta yeah. say this though. I think what you're what you're saying is so on point. Um, it goes to the conversation about permission. It goes to the conversation that we are still asking for permission to exist as free and 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 equal members of society. And the thing is, that's they're not your goal. Like I'm not trying to be hey. equal to white folks. I'm really not like, and and the other thing is that, um, I don't. They don't really have nothing that I want. Like in terms of, of course, you know, everybody wants finances to run yeah. right. But my thing is, I'm getting to the point where I'm starting to realize that you don't have my money. No, like you don't have, you don't even have my money. Like literally, the creator got my bread and. Yes. All I have to do is do what I'm supposed to do to get you to release it to me. But that money ain't yours that you're that you're giving me right here. Is, <laughs> all of this with with you know, all of this is created. It's created. It's it's, it's all created. And when you look at what 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 riches and wealth, even if you go back into that same ancient scripture, it's gonna be some. Look, it's gonna be this right here. It's gonna be cinnamon. It's Listen. gonna be some cinnamon. Hello, hello. Like, like this is wealth. They talking about they came here looking for spices. Listen. Like this is straight. Some of y'all never seen like this is actual cinnamon. What they what they come looking for, sis? Spices. And Grenada's the Isle of Spice. So so you already know. Like, this is my thing is I know a lot of people are like, well, yeah, I don't got it like you. Like. Mm, so good. It's like, okay, you know, I don't have no cinnamon to pull out and no enamel bucket and all of that stuff. And my thing is, but somebody has it. But somebody and has even it. If that's, and even if that's not necessarily what I have my hanging out on my shingle, like, you need to contact me. Maybe I'm going to be like, oh, I don't sell the cinnamon of my personal stash, but here goes the other Grenadian shop, La Bay Market down the road, who they have it. Let me give you their number. Let me give you their email. Like we just literally sit here as though there's no resources. You know, um, let me tell you something. I mentioned, I, I mentioned sorrow. Say it. I mentioned, I mentioned okay. sorrow. I mean, it's right here. This thing is right here. And it's going out my stuff. I, I'm going, look, these, these red raspberry leaves will poke me. So I'm not. Oh. <laughs> but it's like, you know what? This I remember when you posted those. Girl. These they're drying out. These this mm -hmm. this, this is our wealth, guys. This is hold it up, hold it up to the camera again. Okay, I can't see. Hold on, let me look. let me make sure I can. This and this little pokey self, and it's I can't, mm -hmm. this little pokey. Oh yeah, the edges are like serrated, and they're serrated, and also the um vine of the the spine of the leaf is. So it's like when you pull it off, it mm. will look like that. I'm able to grow outside some um, motherwort. Motherwort. Oh, ouch. It's pokey. I laugh at how many of the pokey, how many uh, things for women <laughs> are pokey. <laughs> I laugh at that. Right. Because, you listen, you would tear yourself up with some nettle. And nettle Nothing. is so good for us. Exactly. It is so good for us. But don't nobody want to get stung by no nettle. No, no. And so it's like, you know, I, I love that you mentioned like the wealth and the, and and that they were going literally for prices for they were going for these things and that was wealth. But all we do is we want to know, okay, well, well, see, because I'm learning to grow these things in my mint, and I have some lavender outside, and I have some whatever else, and then I'm finding that it seems like things are growing up in my yard, and I'm looking them up like, what is this? <gasps> Oh my goodness, this is good for indigestion and this and this and this and stuff just start growing because I'm like, hey, you said it when you talked about when we start moving towards it, it's as if it just starts moving towards, towards you. Us. And I love that because you know, some of the things that we look at and we say, I can't have it, I can't this. All I know is my grandmother, my the red dirt road, my grandma hmm. and granddad lived on a red dirt road and they grew food out there. And so we never were hungry. Only mm. because of the poverty. We were never hungry. We were right. never hungry. Literally, she would say, what do y'all want for lunch? Go get some corn off the corn stock. Y'all want that? And get a watermelon out the watermelon patch. Oh, oh, that sounds so good. 
I, I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. I, oh, by the way, black folk, I know we, I know we don't want to, you know, fall into those stereotypes that that we really like watermelon. <laughs> I was but like, I'm gonna eat some watermelon now. I'm, I want y'all to know it's, it's great for your womb, okay? And it's great for men too. All that lycopene is excellent for the prostate and for your testes. Like, come on, y'all. Learn your stuff. And she had the yellow. They had. They were growing a yellow watermelon too. So all I'm the saying, way back then. All the way. Yes. Yes. Wow. They were growing uh, the red and the yellow. Girl, stop. That's some real Africans right there. Okay, so I love you, and I just have to say, I that. love you, and I want everybody who's watching or listening or whatever. I said it before, and I'm gonna say it again. I have my own courses, my own things that I do, and I tell people all the time, honey, I'm introducing you, but every single time I point, I say, now if you want to, mm -hmm. because a lot of them don't know, and they just wait, I, say, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, but I tell them, if you want to go deep, I have sisters that go deep. Mm -hmm. It'll take you deep. Go look at this one. Look at that one. Look at the other one. And you are one of those sisters. You are one of those people that I look and I say, you know, I'm a gatherer. I've, I've, it took mm -hmm. me so long to accept it, that that's my role. You are a gatherer. And I was like, but I want to be deep. I want to, <laughs> I want to be deep. You are deep. I want to be deep like that one. They're like, we need you to look for the connections. It's like, mm -hmm. You know, when I say we, it's just like I'm talking the epigenetic whatever of everything because we all mean. No, I know. I know what you're talking about. And it's like we need you to go deep in helping them see the connections that mm -hmm. you know, because there's women that think we don't have culture. There's still black women that think that we're not that we don't we never had practices and they fall into this thing where they're OK with, you know, the dominant culture telling them what is and what is not. When we were the ones up until 50, 60 years ago, that would, like you said, Southern hospitality, who was making hmm. you welcome? Who was taking right. care of your children? Who was fixing your food? Who was birthing your babies? Who was doing that? We were doing that. So I, I just want you to know how much I appreciate you. And um, I'm so glad we got to do this interview. I'm just so, this conversation, whatever people want to call it, because you are a gift. All your oh, fire, passion. all your passion, all your everything, all of your no nonsense, whatever. Every single thing is a gift. I be sitting back there and say, tell them you're ill. <laughs> 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 Meanwhile, I'm like, if you had come on my page, I would have tried to say it nicely, but I don't know why you went on y'all. <laughs> I would have entertained it. I would have had a discussion <laughs> with you, but you went to the mm -hmm. wall. And meanwhile, I'm like, tell now. And that's mm -hmm. how I, I love your energy. I love um, what you bring to this and that you, thank you for allowing me to be a part of your journey because you were definitely a part of mine. I look at Aww. you and I say, she held my feet to the fire. That night, that day for me was, um, it was something new for me. It was me stepping into something that I was hesitant to step into. Mm -hmm. It wasn't even like, oh, it's an all black environment. The 10 folks on stage was all the black people that was in the <laughs> it was all the black <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm back in the gifted class in elementary school right now. Like, is this what we really doing? The talented 10th? This, this is what we're doing right now. Okay. All and right. That was a thing, this whole thing about why center and think about black people, why I call out black people. It was something I resisted with everything in me. I wasn't raised to only think about black people. I hadn't been right. I hadn't been school. It was not me. It just was not me. But that was the first time that I that I accepted that I am here to help gather the black women. And I'm so mm. glad that in that space that you and some of the others was like, listen, okay, so what's going on? Let's do this. Because I was totally like, whoo, got that done. And they were like, oh no, <laughs> oh no. <they're laughs> and when I look up and I look and I see you, like you said in the email, you're like, this is like two years in the making. It wasn't just a commitment that I was holding everybody else. It was an initiation for me too. It was like saying, stand, mm. stand and let us speak through you. 
you know, let, mm -hmm. let us, let, let us speak through you. We have to save ourselves. That is just it. There is no, uh, there's no one coming to rescue us. There's no law that will help us. Hmm. We never mm -hmm. had that and we survived. The moment we turn away from all of that, now we die, we die, we die. I'm hmm. convinced that that is the part that's missing. And when I look at you and I see you moving forward, I'd be like, girl, you're motivation for me. I'm like, dang, okay. Because sometimes I sit in and I say, what am I doing? <laughs> what in the world? And then I'll look up and I will see some of y'all and y'all are moving. It's like, listen, this is what we're doing. I'm like, yes, that's right. This is what we're doing. This is what we're doing. We're, we're on a path. And I want to thank you for being exactly who you are with all your flavor, with all your everything, with all your sayings, with everything. <laughs> because you are a gift. You are oh, a gift. And I know that there will be in your lifetime so many women that learn how to save themselves because they've taken your course, they've connected with you. And as they learn from you, then they'll their own thing is going to click in and they're going to start remembering and they're going to start allowing. And now I have chill bumps because I believe this so strongly. They're mm. going to start doing the work and learning it because you are like an igniter. It's like you're like, like when you're t -t 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 waiting for it to light. Mm, mm, you're, lighting, mm. you're lighting the women. You're lighting them. You're saying, Oh my oh. goodness, this is why I'd be so tired. Oh yeah. my gosh. <laughs> giving, yes, it makes so much you, you sense. Here, like, like old school, like two rocks. <laughs> <laughs> you have been waiting for the spark. You wait for the spark. And that takes so much, but you, there will be women and, and the work that you are doing is going, is, is, is going to be exponential in the sense that for every one woman you touch, there will be five or six and you might never hear of all of them, but my sister, you know, and never doubt that the work that you have said yes to the fact mm. that you have said yes, that you are doing the work of the most high. And the same mm -hmm. way that there is that house that was built, that the house, mm -hmm. that legacy, that it is being reignited every time you do what you feel called to do. And I want to say thank you for being who you are. I oh, want to make thank you so much so clearly. Tell these people how they can reach out to you, get in touch with you, the whole nine. Thank you so much. Now that you got me over here, I'm just like, oh, I'm having a moment. Um, it, it just means a lot to be seen. Yes. It means a lot for, um, you know, I grew up in the seeing and not heard household and, you know, time frame. And that's why I loved school so much, because you would raise your hand and somebody would want to hear what you had to say. That was amazing to me. Um and I just thank you because you built this platform, because you put us on that platform. I would never be able to actually, I, I'm just like, you know what? I'm always the person who, who hates how, like if we're at, you know, service and someone is filming mm -hmm. or, you know, like I was teaching a collar baking session and there's a part where you were saying prayers, you know, before you actually... Mm -hmm need this dough because you're literally infusing this dough with all these prayers and someone was someone went live and I found about it after and you know I I can't stand yeah. that yeah but at the same time when that recording came out I was just like man if folks cannot see like they can't get the visual I'm like y'all will never have any idea about what actually took place but that's how I know that is real because this, this is the thing we have to realize is that we live in a time right now where there's social media, where everything we do, there's cameras in the street, like, like nothing goes on without it being preserved and on film. But at the same time, even a baby grows in darkness. Right. Oh. You don't see that. You don't see that child until yeah. afterwards. You know, the part of the West African tradition is these women be having on these big boobas. Yep. You don't even know they're pregnant. I remember I had a parent from Senegal I, when I used to be in an after-school program director. 
And I said, you pregnant? And she said, no, no, I just need to go to the gym. Like the next week she had the baby. <laughs> like she was nine months pregnant when I just realized because, yeah, a lot of what our culture teaches is about protection. You know, and I know y'all say, okay, don't get spooky and da da da. And the most high is in charge. The most high is in charge of all things. But he gave us wisdom also to know, listen, you protect what you love. And so I, I, I appreciate you and I affirm you because you gave us a charge to not only protect what we love, but to come out the shadows and to not, um, not be afraid that when we took our stance, that we wouldn't be able to follow through. You saw enough in each of us just for the fact that we were there. And you didn't know any of us very well, but you knew us, you know, you knew that DNA, you knew that spirit and that lineage. And those words are not even, you know, finished being (sighs) blossomed or, or brought into fruition but they still made such an impact. And I know if it made an impact on my life, I'm just the most vocal out of the bunch. You know, that's the only difference. I think all the other people up there in their own lives, I know they're seeing those ramifications, but they may not necessarily deconstruct the way I do or, you know, put the blast out. But in terms of how people can get in contact with me, um, I'm on Instagram. Flatbush at Flatbush Doulas. That's one of our channels um, on Facebook, facebook.com slash Flatbush Doulas. We have a page on there. Uh, the Flatbush Doulas website is Flatbush Doulas, inc.com. And on there, I have a blog. I talk more about the different, there's an explanation of the different services. There's examples of how you can come learn with us. And <clears throat> excuse me, the birth and postpartum course, as well as the African belly binding. Those are both products on another site that I have on Square, but I can't remember that a website <laughs> right off the top of my head. Um, Flatbush Doulas, I want Flatbush Doulas to grow, to be more of a resource and a clearinghouse so that people can get not just information, but they can also get tools. So, you know, we yeah. do have the, the womb steam herbs, but even things like, um, you know, clothing, like I had some dresses made in Ghana. This is like one of them. These little, these little children's dresses. I don't even know where this camera is. Okay, there we go. It's like that. And oh like, gosh. yeah, you know, like little those little boys' pants. You know. Aww. Like, you know, I just wanted to have items, have things, so that when people are like, oh, you know, I have a baby shower coming up, or I my son has, you know these photo shoot or, you know, my daughter's baby name and ceremony. I wanted to be able to say, oh, I have these things. And even to just, you know, to gift those things and so on. Um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to look back over there for anything, but you know, <laughs> cause I'm like, what else I got? Oh, my. But yeah, basically contact me via Facebook, contact me. There's a contact us um, page on the Flatbush Doula's website. My email, you can email me at info at flatbushdoulasinc.com. You can call Flatbush Doulas 347-688-9235. And, you know, we're here for you. If I don't have the answer, I'll find somebody in my network, in my resource to to support you. Um, I know there's people who have reached out over the time and maybe you know, the course hadn't started yet. You know, the thing about this is, is that people will see in you what you haven't seen in yourself yet. Yeah. And so even before I was doing courses, people were like, well, how can we learn with you? And I'm just like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, one of the things that I am about to launch since we talk about, you know, holding the defiance to your feet and stepping up the game. Um, I'm about to launch a membership a research membership club. And so basically how that works is like you said, I go deep. I'm the person who I know the principle that was given to me by one of the matriarchs or the ancestors that was passed on. And I know that it's true, but I know that y'all don't believe me. So I'll go and find the research, right? I'll go and find the research. Um, you know, I got a research article right here. Cinnamon, mystic powers of a minute ingredient. Like, I just got stuff on deck. And I realized that, you know what? 
y'all don't want to do that. Y'all don't want to sit around all the time scouring for research and published studies and so on. But what if you paid ten dollars a month and you got some research articles that you never would have came across otherwise? I because I know in my course, you know, when I'm teaching people about this Grenada midwifery model, they had no idea. But it informs them when they go into the birth room here in the U.S. that, wait a minute, there's a possibility for this could be a different way. So, you know, I'd like for those people who want to learn with me and maybe they're not going to take the course right now, but they just want to, you know, pay a $10 subscription to get some research articles that they can work on on their own. Yeah. Like I said, I do the prenatal, uh, I mean, the preconception nutrition planning and basically, that's a 30-day meal plan. They That comes with 30 minutes of coaching as well. So, you know, just reach out. I'm here. If I can't do it, I'll find someone to do it. But I feel like it's not an accident that the creator is bringing all of us together. And mm -hmm. the time is now. We have to realize that only we can do this. Whew. It's not that we're letting them off the hook. Nope. You know, I think a lot of times we, I know for myself, I don't want to always keep saying we're the answer, we're the answer, mm -hmm. because then it almost like is oppositional to the people who are saying, well, racism is causing it. Right, right. And so I'm not in a fight against that camp. I agree that racism right. is causing it. But I just know that the creator is greater than racism and that the creator's people and the wisdom that he put in us, you know, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. All of these different plants that we are coming up with, they have properties. It's not just your belief that's making them work. And if you will go ahead and take Pitocin, you would take, you know, Cytotech, you would take all these different things. Then why don't you learn some more about some okra? Come on. I mean, that's the way I feel about it. So hopefully my contribution will huh. teach somebody something and it will re-inspire and re-energize them to go back and find it because your ancestors aren't dumb, y'all, for real. And you know, the 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 um when I look at it, the thing that comes to me always is not like you said, there is no opposition between, you know, us being the answer and the racism. I always remind people though, from my historical context <laughs> with grandparents, I always remind them, my grandmother, I've seen her dip her head and bow. I had seen that as a, a, a human to a 15 year old, 20 year old white women, girls, you understand? Mm. So when I've seen that and I said, oh yes, ma'am. And smiling, mm. racism has been here, but mm. they were, so, so that it's not the magic bullet that I look for because it's like, okay, mm -hmm. that was here, right? They've always been racist in my family. So what was the thing that changed? And the change, the thing that changed is that we became comfortable thinking that somehow when they changed the law, that it would change the heart. Integration. Which is really assimilation. That if I assimilate, uh, mm -hmm. if I, I do whatever. If I'm that good person, then, then that will, I'll reap the benefits that others are. And so when I when when I'm talking about us being answers, because in my historical context, it's like the racism was always there. But even as they were fighting, they knew how to take care of each other. And that's the thing I would love to see. And that's what I'm inviting all of the peoples. I mean, you see this chick. I knew we talked about this before we got on how this was likely to be. This is my longest uh, conversation yet, but we knew the potential for that. Because well, we're doing great. <laughs> we have we're wrapping up, and it's and it's only you know we at two thirty three. We doing we great right now. It's a six hour mark yet, you know whatever. <laughs> but I want you all to know. You know um, I'm always trying to connect, you know, I, I, I hate the excuses as well as, as, as Yael does. And I'm, I'm looking at, I'm saying, what can I do? I can introduce you all to some of the fabulous women that I've gotten an opportunity to know and those who I run across. And that's what this special time has been. Me letting you know, one of the most special ones, as far as going back and getting it and going deep, you know, she's one of those 
that that made a decision to go deep. And I'm just so excited. So if you want to connect with Yael, um, her information will be uh, posted on the blog. So make sure you go there to check it. Um, if you're listening to the podcast, go to the blog, click the link. She gave all the details for all the things. And I'm excited. Thank you. Love you so much. And yeah, until we're in each other's space again, right? <laughs> yes. I appreciate you, my sister. And I will see you guys next time. Peace. Those <laughs>